Yes. Please, sir. Assalamu alaikum. We have gathered here today at a conference on the question of Palestine. It's a privilege for me as a Jewish person to be among all activists and diplomats who are here today at this conference standing together on the right side of history and I want to share with you the Jewish viewpoint. I have a big question today. We have gathered in many times in the United Nations on the question of Palestine. For, for almost 75 years we have gathered for the question of Palestine. Let's start, move to the next step. Let's gather for a conference to the answer of Palestine. But I think with my two questions, there can be a solution to the question of Palestine. The first question is, we have lived in peace, in a beautiful peace for hundreds of years. We didn't need any human right group to protect us. We lived in a beautiful peace, Jews and Muslims, and coexist together. What happened after the movement of Zionism starts? When we will understand that the, what the root cause of this problem is, then we will have an answer for the question of Palestine. The second question is, how long will the world be fooled by the Zionists when they claiming that they are speaking in the name of Jews or the Jewish religion? They came to the United Nations a lot of times and claiming in the name of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob that the land is there and therefore they can do all the crimes they are doing on the Palestinian people. We need to understand there is masses of Jews around the world who are standing in opposition to the State of Israel and their actions. So let's be clear and make clear in the United Nations that this is not in the name of the Jewish people, not in the name of the Jewish religion. When we will answer this question, when the world will stop this, then we hopefully can have an answer to the question of Palestine. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I think we can uh, address some of the questions. Maybe I'll start with you, Ahmed. Thank, thank you very much for, for the questions. On, um, on the question from my Jewish friend, thank you for, for this question. It's important to note, and I think I would like to remind myself and, and you all, that in 1975, there was a resolution by the United Nations General Assembly declaring that Zionism is a form of racism and racial discrimination. The same resolution referred to the unholy alliance between Zionism and apartheid South Africa. At that time, it was already known, a matter of public record, that Zionism, that Israel has offered apartheid South Africa the so-called Jericho missiles carrying nuclear weapons. So Israel has been supportive of uh, oppressive regimes, including uh, apartheid South Africa. And, and, and this particular resolution was revoked in 1991 because Israel conditioned its revocation on, to come, on coming to the Madrid Conference for Peace in 1991. So you see, even the whole concept of two-state solution or a compromise was a political maneuver by Israel to get rid of this resolution and then it continued to build settlements. It continued to uh, colonize the land. So I think we're united uh, in this, and as Palestinians, our, um, we like to believe that our moral compass is clear. The Jew Jewish people have always been an integral part and component of the social fabric in Palestine. They, they, they as you describe yourself and, and, and uh, other Jewish friends, they, they consider themselves Palestinians, they were part of our community, and until Zionism was exported to us from Europe with the feeling of guilt, uh, uh, there and the colonial and imperial ambition until that moment we lived in peace and harmony uh, um, and we never had any uh, problems so I think Zionism in my view is is the problem in this situation uh, the, the United Nations General Assembly was uh, accurate when it described it as uh, a form of racism and racial discrimination and the only way to move forward is to um, the, the, the designization of Israeli society because it is an ugly ideology. Uh, just see where it brainwashed, it brainwashed people in Israel into believing that in order for you as Israelis to survive in this world, you have to oppress the Palestinians. It's a sick logic. And it's, it's uh, harming the Palestinians and coast, costing them their, their lives and physical, uh, physical uh, safety. But also it's in a way 
the, the conflation between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, uh, and that's something I learned from my Jewish friend, is actually uh, harming the real and much needed fight for uh, anti-Semitism. Such conflation is uh, dangerous. Uh, uh, and uh, I think we're united with our Jewish friends to always make the distinction that uh, opposing Israeli policies as a government, uh, it is nothing against uh, the Jewish people. It is something against a Zionist ideology, which is again a form of racism and, uh, and racial discrimination. Uh, this channel has featured this uh, Bethlehem re Reverend before. Um, and... Uh, we're about to have this featured again. This, uh, but by the way, um, uh, there are two links in the description. Uh, one is to the documentary known as Jewish Bundist Diaspora Movement, and another is basically, you know, the channel showing itself that it that we do understand what socialism actually is. So those two links will be in the description below. The nuances on how we deal with, you know, Christians, you know, is mentioned in Jewish Bundist diaspora movement. There was a there was a strong consensus about this. So with that said, I I, I would like to say that um the Bethel, the the Lutheran Bethlehem Reverend is one of the most sincere um, voices of Palestinian resistance. Um, uh, one thing that I really do think that um, this has been brought to me many times, and that's that um, <clears throat> how sectarian are we allowed to be towards Christians? Um, and the answer is we're actually in the boon we're actually allowed to be very sectarian towards Christians but only but um, who says this that's just what goes on but at the same time um, there's often a lot of uncomfortability with it because uh, number one not all Christians are the same group and uh, number two um, the authentic Christians that is Christians of the Orient are the most persecuted religious minority in the world completely surpassing the persecution that Muslims and Jewish people both have to go through. Western Christians are of a paradoxical exact opposite. Typically, they tend to be the status quo. Uh, one of the things you'll, we can note also is that the genocide against the Native Americans and First Nations people, genocide against the indigenous uh, Machika people, uh, genocide against you know South, Native South American People genocide against the Mori and the Aborigines and um, and Palestinians has zero connection to the Christians of the Orient. The Christians of the Orient are not the ones who created Westernism. It is that was something that came originally from the Roman Catholic Church. And then you have to also pay attention to the fact that collectively speaking a great deal of roman catholics do not feel comfortable with the legacy of the crusades or the inquisition and they cannot seem to find a reason in their doctrines for it which that's because the actual roman catholic doctrine does not support the crusades or the inquisition what happened was something that has been covered before i will cover it more in detail uh because opinions cannot prevail in this pro in this thing. Uh, what must prevail is the truth. And it is opinion, a very populist opinion, for instance, to say that, well, Christianity, as we know, it comes from the Council of Nicaea. Do you, like, in the same way where you have to be aware of Judo Judeophobia and Islamophobia, you have to be aware of Christophobia as well. However, Christophobia is different. For instance, Islamophobia and Judeophobia are both anti-Semitism. Christophobia does not apply to all Christian groups. And sometimes Christophobia is anti-Semitism and sometimes it's not. Uh, if you have a particular beef with Syriac Orthodox Christianity, that's anti-Semitism, technically. Um, if you have a beef with the Greek Orthodox Church, that's not, Christ not anti-Semitism, but that is Christophobia. Um... Some people have said that what is going to save the Catholic Church is for the non-Roman Catholic Church, non-Roman Catholics to overtake the Roman Catholic Church, and I could see that happening. 
uh, Roman Catholics are the most, uh, are the original Catholic. The original Catholic is the Roman Catholic. Um, but they're not the only kinds. There's Chaldeans, there's Byzantine Catholics. And by the way, Chaldeans and Byzantine Catholics are not both Byzantine. Um, another thing that um, I should point out is Byzantine, Byzantine Catholics are often called Greek Catholics. Whenever anybody uh, says Byzantine Catholic instead of Greek Catholic, it's, to con it's so that you're not confused. Because Byzantine Catholic is technically its own nationality. Um, like Judy, like Jewish nationality, it's diaspora nationality, and like Jewish nationality, it is um, based on culture and religion as opposed to culture and ethnicity. Anyway, um, I just want everybody to know that I will be covering both Christianity and Islam to a much greater detail soon, um, to a much greater degree and with precise accuracy. Um, so, I'm very fond of this palace, this, Be this Bethlehem Palestinian reverend, um, and, uh, again, if you haven't, you should look up his sermon on, you know, Jesus and the rubble. It's really interesting. Um, I think that Judaism needs... As, it go, as Judaism goes through re reawakening, what we often forget is we don't really believe other religions are false. We don't even, we're not even supposed to believe that Christianity is false, necessarily. We're supposed to believe, as we do, that out of all religions in the world, the one with the least amount of truth is Christianity. And that is the truth. The religion with the least amount of credibility is Christianity, but it still does have credibility. And what gives a religion a religion credibility and what gives it not credibility? These are discussions for another time, but these are discussions I particularly will be provoking. But I'll be provoking by providing the facts. Just because you have an opinion does not mean you can sit next to me as an equal and debate me things you don't know what you're talking about. Um, I do not apologize if that sounded arrogant. Um, I'm dealing with a pool of ignorance wherever I go, so that's unfortunately bleeding out. Um, and rather than being overly not personal with you, it's more better if I am personal with you with, with a bit of restraint, and that's what I'm trying to do here. So this um, came out on April 1st, 2024. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. As Christians around the world celebrated Easter Sunday, Palestinians faced severe restrictions on entering the old city in Jerusalem. Palestinian Christians from the occupied West Bank were prevented from reaching Jerusalem for Good Friday to walk the Via Dolorosa, the path Jesus is said to have followed on the way to his crucifixion more than 2,000 years ago. Even before October, Palestinian Christians had to seek permission to visit the old city. In Bethlehem, where Jesus was born, the wall separating Israel from the West Bank cuts through the city, largely empty of tourists this weekend. The Reverend Munther Isaac, who is the pastor at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem, participated in Easter vigil for Gaza on Saturday. This is some of what he said. Today we have entered a new phase of the war of genocide in which the people of Gaza are being killed by hunger, thirst, and disease. They are starved to death. It is a slow death. They are hanging between heaven and earth, dying slowly while the world is watching. They have no form or majesty that we should look at them. From whom men hide their faces? It took more than five months and 32,000 people killed, including 13,000 children, for the UN Security Council to finally pass a ceasefire. But nothing has changed on the ground. Since when does Israel care about UN resolutions? Israel has never been held accountable or even condemned by Western leaders. This remains the single biggest problem today. Right now, we are pleading for aid and food to enter. We gave up on a ceasefire. Just bring food, water, and medicine. Lord, have mercy. Friends, a genocide has been normalized. And as people of faith, if we truly claim to follow a crucified Savior, we can never be okay with this. 
We should never accept the normalization of a genocide. We should never be okay with children dying from starvation, not because of drought or famine, but starvation, man-made catastrophe, because of the empire. A genocide has been normalized just as apartheid was normalized in Palestine. And before that, in South Africa, just as slavery and the caste system were normalized. It has been firmly established to us that the leaders of the superpowers and those who benefit from the modern colonialism do not look at us as equals. They created the narrative to normalize genocide. They have a theology for it. A genocide has been normalized. This is racism at its worst. And the very same political and church leaders who lined up in October, one after the other, to give the green light for this genocide, uh, giving it the cover of self-defense, cannot even bring themselves to condemn the obvious war crimes being committed by Israel. They are good at raising their concern make statements that they are uh, troubled uh, by the killing of our children. We're sorry that the killing of our children by your weapons actually troubled you. They want to convince us that they actually care. So they raise funds, uh, they are silent during the genocide, and then show up afterwards with charity to say that they care. Can we really accept this? Many countries rushed to suspend their funding of UNRWA based on mere allegations that were not fully proven, yet did nothing with regards to the clear findings of the ICJ. The amount of hypocrisy is incomprehensible, and the level of racism involved for such hypocrisy is appalling. And now some politicians claim that their patience with Israel is ending, and we say, nothing can wash the blood from your hands. That was the Reverend Munther Isaac, Isaac in English, pastor at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church, speaking in Bethlehem at an Easter vigil for Gaza Saturday, joining us now from Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank. Uh, Reverend Isaac, thank you for joining Democracy Now! again. You joined us at Christmas time after you'd made that famous Christ in the rubble. I'm wondering if you can share a description of what's happening in Bethlehem today in the occupied West Bank and also talk about what happened on Good Friday. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Bethlehem, like the rest of Palestinian cities in the West Bank, continue to be almost completely isolated uh, since the war began. And when I say isolated, I'm not just referring to the fact that we cannot go to Jerusalem, uh, but even a trip to other Palestinian towns and cities right now uh, is a big hassle. It's a risky uh, trip because of uh, the potential of uh, settler violence on the roads that Israel control between all the Palestinian towns uh, and cities. Uh, and the delays that the checkpoints are causing. Sometimes you could wait up to two to three hours just on the checkpoint with no movement. Uh, it's all part of uh, intimidation uh, and control. Um, and as I said, here in Bethlehem, we're also completely now isolated from uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is 15, 20 minutes drive from uh, where I'm speaking from. Uh, Jerusalem, you know, we used to be considered like uh, another neighborhood in Jerusalem, like two twin cities. But right now, uh, for the first time in history, uh, we are completely isolated as Bethlehem and Jerusalem. And again, if you could talk about what happened on Good Friday, the procession in the old city. Well, it was um, not the normal procession. I mean, at least in previous years, uh, some Palestinian Christians from the West Bank uh, were given those permits uh, by the Israeli military to cross to Jerusalem and attend uh, whether the uh, Via de la Rosa uh, Jerusalem uh, or, uh, you know, visit Jerusalem, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre during the Holy Week. Uh, permits are not available uh, these days. Uh, the normal uh, processions and prayers that take place in the old city with many faithful um, were missing, and you could see that very small numbers uh, took part uh, in these uh, prayers. 
and, and let's be clear, the idea that we need a permit is, is ridiculous to begin with. That's, that's the problem. The problem is not that Israel is not giving us permits. The problem is that we need permits to begin with as Palestinian Christians from Bethlehem or Ramallah, that we need those permits uh, to go uh, to Jerusalem. This is the real scandal here. Can you describe the wall through Bethlehem for people to understand who haven't been there? Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a really ugly concrete barrier uh, that's uh, uh, taller even than the Berlin Wall uh, that cuts deep into some of our uh, neighborhoods. Uh, it's very visible from uh, very uh, many places in Bethlehem. It gives the impression that we live in a big prison. And this is not just an impression because uh, all it takes for Israel right now is to close two checkpoints and then we're completely uh, isolated in, uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, the wall speaks volumes. I mean, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the message that it's sending that we're not wanted, that we're as if dangerous. Uh, there is a psychological effect to it, again, because it's very uh, visible. And the route of the wall is very indicative. As I said, it cuts deep into Palestinian uh, neighborhoods uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, and it basically confiscated all the land surrounding Bethlehem area. Uh, by that, I mean the agricultural land uh, and uh, land that would have been uh, uh, the space for natural expansion. That's why Bethlehem is very crowded uh, right now. And, and when we say it confiscated uh, Palestinian land, Please understand, I'm not just making a political statement as if to say this is Palestinian land. This is land owned and farmed by Palestinian families, including Palestinian Christian families, uh, for generations. Uh, but the wall has completely isolated us from these, uh, from our lands. Reverend Muntat Hisak, if you can talk about Gaza now, how many Christians, Palestinian Christians, are there? Why didn't most Christians leave Gaza City to go to Rafa? Yes, there is around anything between eight to 900 Palestinian Christians uh, left uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and as you said, most of them uh, preferred to stay in Gaza, in the city, and they preferred to take refuge uh, in one of the two churches, the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Uh, with the Catholic Church now hosting the majority because it has a bigger compound with a school. Um, the decision was made uh, from what they told us um, by everyone involved. They, they met and they decided that uh, they don't want to go to the unknown. Uh, they don't want to end up in tents in Egypt, maybe, or in the desert. Uh, don't forget that many still carry the memories of 1948, the Nakba. So they don't want to leave their homes uh, again. Uh, and the message they told us is they'd rather die in the church rather than uh, leave to the unknown and end up somewhere that they don't uh, uh, know. Uh, so they, they chose to be together. They chose to be in the two churches. Um, and at times uh, it was very difficult. Uh, the Shifa hospital is a, from walking distance from the two churches. Um, so you could imagine the amount of trauma and fear they experienced. Uh, many were killed in this uh, war already, whether by bombardment or by snipers uh, or from uh, diseases. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem right now is if you get sick in Gaza, chances are very high you don't survive because there is no medical care uh, at all. I wanted to ask you two questions, one about the Pope giving his Easter sermon at the Vatican, calling for a ceasefire. While he called for peace, a Republican member of the U.S. Congress publicly suggested Gaza should be bombed, quote, like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. It was Michigan Congress member Tim Wahlberg, who himself is an ordained pastor who made the comment during a recent town hall. Listen carefully, it's a little off mic. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. It, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over quick. Your thoughts shouldn't be sending a dime of humanitarian aid, and it should be dealt with like the U.S. dealt with 
Nagasaki and Hiroshima? I'm angry. It, it really makes me angry. And I've heard these comments and I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. Uh, it makes me angry as a Christian, it makes me furious as a Christian for the lack of mercy and compassion. Uh, this is definitely not Jesus' way. I can't, I can't understand which Bible are they reading. And then uh, when I search about uh, this uh, congressman, only to discover that he went to uh, prestigious and influential evangelical seminaries, uh, he was a pastor. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I mean, this is a stain on the credibility of the Christian witness. And the idea that uh, he brings those two cities as, as, as a positive example. It's, it's beyond my comprehension. He brings the example of two cities that were completely destroyed with hundreds of thousands killed as, as a positive example. Uh, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I couldn't believe that, you know, he would think of that. Only to think that the real scary part of all of this is that Israel could actually do it and get away with it. Because of people like him providing the political and theological cover to execute such a genocide, just as we've been witnessing for the last uh, five to six months. This is the scary part that he thinks of it as a possibility and that we know that if it happens, there are those who will continue to defend it. I'm horrified by this. As a pastor, I'm appalled uh, uh, and I'm angry because this is not a Christian witness. Uh, <laughs> Finally. And we need more calls for ceasefire. Uh, we need stronger calls for a ceasefire like the one Pope Francis made. Uh, we need those church leaders to come to, 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 to the Holy Land, come and demand a ceasefire. It's beyond tragic. Uh, we need to be very forceful in our demand right now for a ceasefire. Finally, in a moment, we're going to be talking about the mass protests um, in Tel Aviv uh, around calling for, it used to be the resignation of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now it's for the overthrow of the government. Uh, your thoughts? Well, I think Netanyahu should have resigned on October 7th. He led us uh, to this mess. Uh, and I'm not just saying uh, that because of his negligence, but his policies, this current Israeli government's policies, uh, uh, their policies with regard to continuing the split between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas, empowering one over the other, even bringing cash money, uh, the fact that they intentionally killed the two-state solution, uh, all of that led us, I mean, these are all the policies that led us to this mess. And we've been saying that things are about to explode. We've been warning for that. So to me, he should have resigned. If he had any integrity, he should have resigned immediately after October 7th for causing the death of so many innocent Palestinians and Israeli uh, civilians, uh, as we are witnessing uh, right now. Reverend we definitely Munther, need... I want to thank you so much for being with us, Reverend Munther Ishaq, Palestinian Christian theologian, pastor at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem. He addressed... Easter Vigil for Gaza on Saturday. We are now going to uh, bring this to a conversation between Dr. Weisfeld and Ahmed. This presentation came out on March 28, 2024. Here are now, here we are. And the genocide is ongoing, continues every day, a massacre a day. What a history. What a... Actually, multiple massacres a day. Yeah. In different multiple. places, yeah. In different yeah, places. Different uh, yes. Even in yes. Janine, uh, yeah. yeah. They, yesterday, they, they murdered over 80 people in, uh, in a few massacres across uh, Gaza Strip. In addition, to the murder of about five people in, uh, in on the West Bank, in Jenin mm -hmm. and Nablus and uh, mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's it's a it's a tragedy unfolding before the world, and it's been going for six months. Uh, despite uh, the ICJ, you know, uh, advisory to the Zionists not to continue their massacre and starvation. 
Mm. And despite the United Nations Security Council resolution for ceasefire, at least for the month of Ramadan, the mm. Zionists, they went on a rampage, murdering mm. and starving more and more people, like telling the world mm. that we are above the international law and we want to do what we ever want to do. Nobody could mm. stop us. If you want to stop us, come and stop us. That's yeah. basically what the Zionists are telling the world community. Mm. And that's what they call self-determination. Okay. <laughs> you know, as if only, you know, only a, a fraction of the Jewish people who call themselves Zionists have a right to self-determination and nobody else has a right to self-determination. <laughs> well, I they can do whatever they fraction. want, you know. I won't call them fraction. There are a substantial number of Jews who are Zionists, but they don't represent all the Jews, definitely. And they don't represent... Uh, Jewish uh, tradition and Jewish religion itself, from my understanding, that Jews are prohibited uh, according to Jewish teaching. That's what, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That we're not supposed to have a state until the return of the Messiah. That's even with the return of the Messiah, no yeah. state. You know, yeah, a state but, is a, a modern invention of Protestantism. You know, it has nothing absolutely. to do with you know Judaism or Islam. Uh, Islam has a concept of a of a caliphate, and it's a, uh, it's a state model. It's a state a, model. A state caliphate. model, but that seems to be like a, a copy of the Western no. model. No, no, the Western, existed before, no. right? The caliphate, the caliphate, its way precede the, the Western models. At the time when there were caliphates, there were no no Europe, no Europe. They were just living in in in. <laughs> In what we call now caves and uh, tents, etc. So yes. uh, Europe was was way behind. Europe is very, was very underdeveloped. It still is. Oh, yeah, definitely. They, they they were start developing uh, or de developing. Uh, Europe was start to developing after the Arab uh, con conquer of uh, southern Spain and starting a, a state there, which has universities and culture where lots of Europeans came to study in the Arab universities and many Jews moved from Europe to, to uh, that area who are now called the, the Sephardis, Sephardi mm -hmm. Jews who lived in that state and they flourished actually in, in, in Andalus, we call it Andalus or Andalusia. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's another issue. Uh, we're not going to go into detailed history. Yeah. So, um, the Zionists, I believe, they actually self-inflected traumatizing, uh, traumatization or trauma of believing that the entire world is against them and they own all the pogroms and the Holocaust to themselves. Therefore, hmm. in order as, as a trauma, as a trauma uh, patients, the Zionists, I'll call them, uh, they are acting. They are acting as if everybody owes them. No, they owes nothing to the world. They are above the world because they are the chosen one, mm -hmm. and because the six million Jews perished during the Holocaust. Therefore, the world. Who is the world to tell them what to do? They can do whatever they want, whenever they want, without any uh, responsibility. This is called uh, the traumatized, traumatized psychosis. psychosis. Mm. They could murder, kill, do whatever they want because the world let us die in the Holocaust. Whereas the Zionists were actually collaborators with the Nazis. <laughs> this yes. is true. Yeah. And before it's... 1967, they didn't talk about the Holocaust. There were no Holocaust commemorations. There was no, you know, Warsaw Ghetto commemoration. 1973, I and... Uh, 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 Joe Meslin, the president of the uh, Parrot School in, in the uh, Workers' uh, Circle of Toronto, mm -hmm. were the first to set up a Warsaw Ghetto commemoration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Zionists, they use whatever they want whenever they, they need it, whenever they need it. Yes. So at that time, they didn't need to use the Holocaust. They, yeah. don't want, they didn't need to weaponize the Holocaust until, when the, until the world started opening their eyes its eyes to the crimes of Zionism in Palestine. Then it was so convenient to organize the Holocaust and uh, anti-Semitism, which is now 
widely used by the Zionists to silence all its critics. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying there's no uh, anti-Semite, but uh, the vast majority of those people being labeled as anti-Semites were actually the anti-Zionist, and it's uh, it's a pretty uh, uh, revealing how the Zionists they could uh, weaponize whenever they want, whatever mm-hmm. they want, in order to maintain their uh, Nazi-like state in Palestine. Yes, that's what happened to me when I was charged by. Uh, by a complaint filed with the hate crimes division of the uh, uh, Montreal uh, SPVM, mm-hmm. uh, you know, police. Uh, I mean, even the policewoman, you know, herself said she didn't consider uh, my act to be anti-Semitic, but she was still speaking in the name of the hate crimes division of the Montreal police. And that's what's going to be presented to the court, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and I'm a second generation Holocaust survivor. So, yep. you know, the oh, Zionists no, uh, are manipulating... Oh, they, they manipulate every little inch that they can yeah. get, you know, yeah, and uh, that, they claim to represent the Jewish uh, people. But Abraham, Dr. Yes. Abraham, there's a name for you by the Zionists. You are a self-hating Jew. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. You know, because you, they cannot call you anti-Semite. So no. for me, they could call me anti-Semite, although I'm a Semite, but doesn't yes. matter. Doesn't It doesn't add. It doesn't apply to me. Uh, they will call me anti-Semitic. You, because you're Jewish, they cannot go that way. They will tell you you are a self-hating Jew. Hmm. I don't. I don't <laughs> they hate being have Jewish. A name for everything. I don't hate being Jewish. You know, yeah, I, I hate Zionism. That's all. <laughs> yeah, it's but... very simple. You know, like they yeah, don't understand. Know. You know, and they have to sort of claim to be representative of the Jewish people when they are not. They don't have any mandate from the Jewish people to speak in our name. No, you know, course. Netanyahu does that continuously. He goes to Congress and he speaks the name of the Jewish people, even Jewish Americans who do not have a vote. And he is, you know, the Zionist elections there, you know, like they have nothing to do with the government, you know, that Netanyahu speaks for. It's just a Zionist clique, it's kind of a mafia operation that they have it going is. there. It is. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It, it, this is the, the, the work order in the West. Uh, they recognize only those uh, states or entities that work for them, okay, mm-hmm. work for the, the Western imperialism. For example, we have in, 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 on the occupied Palestinian West Bank, where there is uh, somebody called the Palestinian entity or Palestinian authority by um, Mahmoud Abbas. He is, the, he is the representative of the Palestinian people, although it, there was the latest uh, polls shows that if there were election held today, he will garner less than twelve percent of the Palestinian wow. vote. Yeah, he is. He is the Palestinian president, and mm. everybody go to pilgrimage to him and talk to the Palestinian representative. So it goes the same thing with the mm. with the Nazi Zionist leadership, who are yeah. the the. Jewish leadership mm-hmm. in the in in the eyes of the West, yeah. they will not they will not look at Jewish voices, Jewish uh, anti-Zionist Jews, uh, the Bunds, everybody. They are those are they're no good. Only yeah. Zionists represent the Jews. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, he even appointed a prime minister recently. I mean, like forget about yeah. an election. He just appointed somebody. Who is this person? What's going on? This guy. This guy is uh, Muhammad Mustafa. He used to, he came uh, from the World Bank. He worked in the World Bank for 16 years. Wonderful. He <laughs> was, yeah, he was the head of the Palestinian Investment Corp, which is a, 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 is a semi a quasi governmental organization that's supposed to invest money on the, on the behalf of the Palestinian people. He makes uh, over half a million dollars of uh, a month, a year, sorry, a year of salary. He is a he is a member of the PLO, and he is very well corrupted leader or person. So mm. uh, you know uh, Abu Mazen or Mahmoud Abbas, he appointed him to be the new prime minister of um, I would call it Abbasstan, you know, uh, which is <laughs> <laughs> which is a, a, a group of people who uh, work uh, as a VG government to the Zionist. In, in, in on the West Bank of Gaza, Gaza, they have no no place there to, to 
put their feet there. Yeah, you said so, Vichy government. Vichy, it, yeah. Yeah, Vichy exactly. government. He's a Palestinian. He's a Palestinian equivalent of Vichy government. That's yeah. exactly what they're doing. Okay, mm. Exactly what they're doing. It's like they go after the resistance. They kill them. They arrest them. They uh, pass intelligence to the Zionists to go and murder Palestinians, etc. Hmm. Um, oh my, it's so overwhelming, you know. It is. But they're being isolated, increasingly isolated, even uh, according to uh, the Jewish people, Jewish Americans, you know, uh, the, the biggest... Zionists, uh, yeah, the, the biggest sign is the United States, you know, Chuck Schumer, who's the uh, head of the uh, Democratic caucus in the Senate, and is a Zionist, and he says so. He's the one who just came out and called for the, basically, the overthrow of Netanyahu, called for new elections, even though there's no election coming yeah. out. They're embarrassed. They're embarrassed because uh, the, the action by the Zionist state, it uh, really... Uh, made uh, the empire, with, including the Zionists in that empire, feel uh, cornered after six months of massacres and, and genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought the Zionist uh, army will finish the job in a month or less than a month. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's dragging for six months and the Zionists are bogged down uh, in, in Gaza where everybody in the world they say enough is enough. So they feel cornered. They're not being, he's not, he's not by any imagination a pro-Palestinian. Chuck uh, Schmuck, I called him, Chuck Schumer. He's an artist Zionist. He, he supported the massacres for the, the first four, six, five months in Gaza. Mm -hmm. But when becoming uh, clearly, clear, that there's no end to what they're doing, the Zionists. He said, well, there's somebody to be blamed. We're not gonna blame Israel, the state. We're not gonna blame the Zionist army, the fascist Zionist army. We're not gonna uh, blame the 91% of the, the Israelis who were calling for more murder and killing. We gotta blame someone, somebody we have to throw them under the bus to show that Israel is innocent, the army is innocent, the Israelis are innocent, and we are the empire, we're innocent. It's him, it's it's uh, Netanyahu. No, mm. Netanyahu was acting and behaving in, in, in concert of you, Chuck, Chuck Schmuck, mm. okay? Yeah. And in concert of what the Zionist settler colonists wanted in, in Gaza to happen. Mm. But thanks to the steadfasting of the people, the resistance, the resilience of the resistance in uh, Gaza and in southern Lebanon made that Chuck Schmuck change or change his rhetoric to at least to 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 the public. Say, you know, it's it's him, not us. Mm. Yes, he had to because the younger generations have already turned against uh, the Zionist regime, uh, Jewish. Uh, young Jewish Americans as well, the majority who are opposed to the Zionism, the Zionist trip now, the <coughs> Zionist yeah. genocide. You know, it's it uh, Netanyahu first announced that this was going to be months and months, if not a year or two years of fighting, and nobody sort of paid attention to him. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's I mean, what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, this is what's going to happen. It's going to happen, uh, and the resistance will not uh, give up. Because the resistance is the people's resistance. It's not just a group of of, of uh, youth who are fighting. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, interconnected uh, uh, the resistance with the people. So the people mm. who are actually resisting in in Gaza, mm. whether they're resisting by steadfasting, resisting by fighting the Zionists, resisting by by uh, uh, fighting the hunger, fighting the displacement. So it's the entire people are resisting the Zionist uh, murder machine. And uh, the people will always win. The people, mm -hmm. when they have will, they will mm -hmm. uh, be victorious. And the yes. Zionists will be defeated. Yes. Whether today, tomorrow, a month, two months down the road, 
they were defeated. Actually, there's lots of uh, reports coming from the Zionist state saying that uh, uh, we're lost, we are losing the war in Gaza, we're bugged down, we are in the swamps of Gaza, we are making no headways, even the areas we declared, it's been cleared in the north, you know, that the resistance are ba is back in the north, just a few days ago, they attacked the settlements of Ashkelon and uh, other uh, other areas, and uh, of course the envelope, the Gaza envelope uh, settlements being bombarded every day, and uh, the Zionists are losing big time. Of course, the Zionists are hiding their casualties as usual. Every now and then they say, "Oh, we lost a soldier, or we lost uh, a corporal, or." 20s injured, but uh, the, actu the actual picture is totally different uh, than um, what they portray to be. Mm -hmm. uh, they are actually, they are losing big time, uh, either in the south or in, the, in Gaza or in northern Palestine. Actually, in northern Palestine for the past two months, which daily, there's daily fighting, daily attacking by, by Hezbollah, the Zionist uh, military installations, and and uh, troops uh, troops areas, uh, they didn't even mention one killed, not even one injured, mm -hmm. for two months. Mm -hmm. it, although Hezbollah very proud to announce the names of its martyrs, uh, on the other hand, the Zionists will not mm -hmm. <laughs> say that we lost one one single soldier in two months. No. I mean, nothing counts for the Zionist regime, only power, you know, they don't care about their own soldiers, their own citizens, they will bomb, you know, all the hostages, you know, they don't care, they oh, already yeah. killed, you know, 31 of the prisoners of war there, you know, right. and they right. and they just announce it, and, you know, as if it's normal course of events. They claim, I've been reading, you know, the Zionist regime claims that they have killed 6,000 uh, resistance fighters. And they say this is a great achievement. I don't, it's probably inflated, you know, but they say it's a great achievement because they claim that the Hamas fighters only numbered some 27,000 or 30,000. Yeah, Lately, but, uh... they've revised their figure. All of a sudden, they realize that there's much more, you know, Hamas fighters than they had realized. Now they're saying that it's 40,000, not 30,000. A big difference, huh? Yeah, but, but there's uh, one thing. Um... Uh, but a month ago, or more or less, they were claiming they killed 20,000 of, of Al Qassam. Okay. And there's only four or 5,000 left in Rafah. That's why they have to go into Rafah. Now you tell me it's 6,000. Mm. Okay. So, yes, of course, uh, there's lots. We, we, we lost lots of martyrs. Okay. It's a resistance. Uh, their backs, uh, their overhead is is open to the Zionist attacks. They're indiscriminate. So, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we, we don't, we don't uh, think that even if we lose 10,000, uh, it doesn't mean anything. It means that we are resisting, okay? By the numbers, it works for to their own audience. It doesn't work for our own audience, okay? We don't, we are not, fight, we are fighting a symmetric war. A war with people who are just having collision calls, uh, RPGs, and uh, you know, and maybe sniping machines. That's what they have, you know. Basically, that's what they have. In, mm -hmm. in, in, in versus a, a, a NATO, a NATO army. We are fighting mm -hmm. the NATO. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're talking about three hundred uh, daily. There's over three hundred uh, U.S. made uh, jets bombarding, bombarding. Gaza. You have about 15 different types of drones, whether it's armed or unarmed, it, it's covering the, the skies of the Gaza Strip. Over 3,000 of them if 24 hours, 7 days a week. Then you have the heavy uh, bombardment from sea and from land. Then you have the tanks. You have everything. You have all the technology in their disposal. Yet, they cannot hold one piece of territory in the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. They've been kicked, actually, they've been kicked out of many areas. They actually, they withdrew because they had mm -hmm. heavy losses. Mm -hmm. So 5,000, 10,000, even 20,000, which is, I think it's a big number. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, Vietnamese lost millions of people mm-hmm. where they're fighting the, uh, the, Zion, the, the Americans, actually. The Zionists. Yeah, <laughs> 1.3 million or maybe 3 million from yes. uh, different estimations. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I mean, um, well, when you're fighting a symmetrical war, uh, a liberation war, uh, you, you, it's uh, conceivable to expect losing a lot of, of martyrs. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, this is how, it, how the equation works. That's what happened, you know, in the resistance against the Nazis. My yep. mother's brother, you know, he was lost. He was mm-hmm. a partisan. First set up an underground railway to say, you know, rescue the, the women from the Warsaw Ghetto. Yes. Then he was a partisan, you know, when the Nazis invaded Russia. Then he was recruited, yeah. conscripted into the Red Army. And then mm-hmm. he was lost. Like uh, the Red Army, wow. Lost. Yeah. Uh, I mean, altogether with the civilians, you know, there was 27 million that were lost yes. by, so, there you by go. Russia. But yeah. they, they triumphed at the end. There's yeah. one one uh, information uh, info I would like to add, throw in. To the situation because not too many people knows about it. In 1949, there was a, 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 um, a ceasefire agreement between the Arab countries and the Zionist state, 1948-49, in Rod- Rhodes Island. Okay, and at that time, Gaza Strip used to be 556 square kilometers. Okay. So the Egyptian hit at that time was the royal uh, Farouk or King Farouk regime holding the the strip. And due to the attacks of the Palestinian Fidayeen at that time, which is a guerrilla means in Arabic, okay, the Zionists complained to the British who relayed that to King Farouk that this this was going on, what's happening. So the Zionists needed a buffer zone. So they said uh, it was an agreement in 1950, I think, or 51, which I'm not very sure, either 50 or 51. There was an agreement signed between uh, the uh, military ruler of Gaza, is an Egyptian officer by the name of Mahmoud Riyadh, signed uh, 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 an agreement with the Zionist army called coexistence agreement in it he he will withdraw his troops inward and he give up 191 square kilometers to the zionists seating them a land is not his anywhere it's a palestinian land in these areas okay the all the palestinians were there were being forced by the egyptian into gaza another nakba a small mini nakba yes sir this in within this 191 square kilometers, the Zionists created a few Moshavim, Moshav, which is a, a kibbutz, a military kibbutz, okay, which now called Gaza envelope. Which in October 7, the Palestinians broke through the concentration camp and went to the land, it's, it's rightfully belonged to them, and according to the ceasefire agreement of 1949. So these la- these settlements, they were not uh, a regular Israeli town. They were moshavs. Okay, everybody know what a moshav is. As I said, it's a it's a military uh, mixed mixed military and agricultural uh, settlement. So what happened? Even if there were civilians mur- killed or murdered, as I say, it's it's uh, within the rights of the international law of rules of engagement of liberation movement fighting back the occupation. So I'd like to throw that information. It's very important for people to know that Gaza Strip used to be 556 square, square kilometers. Now is 300, 365 square kilometers. Mm, yes, yes. It's 556 uh, square kilometers, I think was the designation under the partition plan passed by the United Nations General no, Assembly. No, the part, no, 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 no. No, no. Partition oh. plan, the land is way bigger than that. It goes up to Yaffa. Up to you. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. Uh, no, that uh, has nothing to do with the partition plan. Partition plan give uh, Gaza, well, if we want to consider Gaza area, you're talking about minimum about six, 7,000 square kilometers because it encompasses part of northwestern uh, Naqab, 
desert. So uh, uh-huh. that's not uh, part of the partition plan. It's uh, oh, yes, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the Armistice Armistice uh, uh, Agreement in Rhodes Island, yes. uh, 1949. Yeah, where <laughs> when the when uh, King Abdullah the first at that time. In, in that agreement, he ceded the uh, another 1,500 square kilometers to the Zionists from the West Bank, which is called the Triangle, Triangle area, which is uh, now it's called, part of it called uh, the city of, of Umm al-Faham. It's uh, within now the perimeters of Israel itself. So there's lots of... Uh, Issues mm. that many people don't know. So, fifteen hundred mm. square kilometers gone to the Zionists, without mm. any fighting, without anything, just given as a, as a, as a gift. Mm. Okay, mm. because the Zionists ask him, ask him to give it to them, so he give it to them. Mm. And the same thing goes by with the Egyptian, mm. giving them one hundred ninety square kilometers for just to coexist and make the Zionists feel comfortable at night. Mm. 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 This armistice agreement of uh, 49, it's uh, what's called the Green Line as far as the West Bank is concerned, is it not? Yes, yes, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that's not even the, you know, the boundary set by the partition plan. It's just an armistice agreement. It's not a frontier. No, 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 no. no. It doesn't no, belong you know, to the Zionist no. state. Yet no. they claim it, you know, as being you know, uh, the uh, pre-67 uh, Zionist state. Yes, and, uh, no. And, and, and even though it's, you know, not... Uh, not uh, certified, you know, by the UN General Assembly, you know, has no legitimacy no. whatsoever. Mm-hmm. No, of course not. You know, if you, if you want to go back to 1947 partition plan, most of the corridor between uh, Yaffa and the settlement of Tel Aviv, all the way to Al Quds, which is they call it Jerusalem, that huge parcel of land used to be part of the Palestinian state. According to the partition plan, all that being swallowed up by the Zionists. Mm-hmm. Actually, the Yassin massacre was part of that Palestinian statehood, mm-hmm. and that you know uh, we know what happened in the massacre and many other areas, uh, Lud, Ramla, uh, all were part of the Palestinian state. They were all swallowed by the Zionists. So uh, mm-hmm. it's the Zionists uh, took over um, over over twenty percent of where they allocated by the illegitimate uh, partition plan. Yes. Um, I think they went uh, from uh, 52 to 74% of uh, historic Palestine. No, from 54% to 78%. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yes. So uh, that's quite a bit. It's a, oh, yeah. It's quite a bit of land. They took um, um, most of the upper Ga- Galilee, we call it Al-Jalil, used to be part of the Palestinian state. The Zionists follow it. Mm-hmm. Most of the land, um, uh, as I said, between the corridor, it's a huge corridor, like you're talking about 30 kilometers, uh, 30 to 40 kilometers wide to about 50 kilometers uh, length. That means also uh, between uh, Yaffa and Al Quds being swallowed by the Zionists. Many parts around uh, Gaza, Gaza Strip. Uh, all being swallowed up by the Zionists. Uh, so, so many areas uh, the Zionists swallowed up uh, to secure their uh, state. Uh, and um, it turns out that their state is not secured. It's only 1,200, took 1,200 fighters <laughs> to break down its security and, uh, you know, uh, insult their um, bride of, of uh, the most uh, advanced and strong army of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean they do have the equipment, they do oh, have yeah. the soldiers, they do have conscription, but yes. they don't have the mentality. They don't have, they have the, a delusion of power. Exactly, exactly. Yes. They're cowards. That's all. That's what it is. They're just cowards. They yeah. just murder and kill from above, as I said, from the sea, yeah. from uh, land, by far, by. 14 different drones, uh, some of them armed with submachine guns uh, and uh, and uh, hellfire. And uh, even with all this technology and cyber technology and high tech, et cetera, et cetera, you name it, they mm. cannot, they cannot uh, control a 300 square 
365 square kilometers for six months. The only victory they had done so far is murdering and injuring and maiming over 100,000 Palestinian people, destroying about 80% of Gaza and rendering about 20% of soil as not good for uh, for agriculture or usage. Yes, they've polluted the, so the soil with uh, sea salt, with uh, seawater. And and with depleted uranium. They use depleted Ooh. uranium heavily. They use, of course, of course. And uh, with uh, white phosphorus. White phosphorus mm. is a, is a uh, chemical. Goes yeah. into, the, into the soil and, and contaminated. Plus the depleted uranium. And the salt, the sea salt water. I mean, sea salt water it could be after after a while, it will be washed by rain, etc. But the chemicals that uh, resist to go away, and oh, that's yeah. twenty percent of a small area is a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. Wow. We're talking well, about uh, this. This Zionist monster is, I believe, is as bad and if if not worse than uh, than the Nazis. If we mm. want to look at it, uh, you know, in comparison, if they could get away with uh, everything the Nazis uh, had done, they would do it, you know. But they're only oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. by uh, international pressures. Yeah, my, yeah. My, I mean, my, my. I mean, the people, the people were in concentration camps for five years in 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 Europe. The mm. people of Gaza, they've been actually since the beginning of the first Intifada, not from night. 2007 no from 2000 onward for 24 years people in gaza being under siege hmm. oh your connection has frozen Man, even, well yeah go ahead uh, but, your connection had been frozen there for a little while but we're coming oh, to the okay. end of our time allocated in any case so uh what can we say in conclusion? You know, what do we have uh, to look forward to? What do we have to do? What to, what's going to be the end of this genocide? How is it going to end? I don't know. I think uh, the war will continue. I think uh, the Zionists are going to Rafah, as I said before. And I don't think they will change their mind because this is survivor for them especially for Netanyahu and his thugs in the government, the, right, mm. the so-called right wing, I call them Nazi government. Mm. And uh, I think uh, the, the war in the north will expand uh, as if they go to into Rafah. Uh, I don't know what's the end, but I think I could, I could see that the people will never be defeated. Mm. The uh, International Court of Justice is going to come down with a decision uh, on the occupation, the occupation when? of the... In the beginning of April, they've announced already that they're going to be coming down with a decision. Oh, likely, a, yeah, likely a decision to condemn the occupation, you know, but what are they going to do? This is an advisory opinion that they were asked to, uh, to investigate by the UN General Assembly. So this advisory opinion is going to go back to the UN General Assembly and the General Assembly is supposed to be doing something about it. You know what? Expelling Israel from the uh, General Assembly, suspending Israel from... You know, the Zionists from the General Assembly, uh, you know, that's possible. That That's the most likely, you know, scenario, you know, but it's the least effective, you know, because what do they care? You know, they, they announce, they, you know, in, in General Assembly in any case, they don't even want to be there. So, any you know, news like, about ICJ uh, decision? The ICJ, the International Law of Justice. This would be an ICJ decision on the occupation, okay, okay, uh, separate okay. from the decision on genocide. Now okay, okay. they're being asked to do something about their decision on genocide. So they're going to have to be uh, uh, recommending some sort of procedure by the General Assembly for sanctions against the, uh, the Zionist regime. Sanctions mm -hmm. would be effective, yes. But the United States is not going to follow the sanctions. They're going to continue not. supplying them with, you know, the, no, no, the utmost weapons. I, you know... I the international legality is important, but I don't see it uh, as important as as big uh, maker or shaker. I think the the ground, I mean the battleground, which may, will will uh, decide uh, whether the Zionists will stop their slaughter or not. And I believe that Hezbollah has a lot to play in the north to uh, rein in the Zionists and make them stop by 
make them pay for big casualties uh, in the north in Palestine. Mm. This is what mm. I see. It. It's other, there's no other way. So the battle is going to expand and mm. the Zionists should be, should be defeated. Other than mm. that, there's no, nothing we can stop the Zionists. Well, the Zionist port of Elat has been shut down now by uh, the Yemen blockade on the transiting uh, boats uh, going through the uh, Red Sea. Yes, so yeah, but that's, that's another that's, front. That helpful. That helps. Yeah, but I'm not saying it's not not helping, definitive. But... Yeah, it's not no, going no, to decide the matter. Yeah, what you need is is just make the Zionists pay dearly, make them feel that if they continue, well, they lose more. That's the only way. So. Hmm. No and other the other way. front that I've opened up and others is uh, inside the Jewish community. We're yeah. confronting the Zionists from within the Jewish people and destroying yeah. their base of support. And that's it's the, working, that's you know. That's, that's, it, that's, uh, that, I call it the third front on the Zionism. The first one in Gaza, second front in southern Lebanon, northern Palestine. And the third front is, is as important as the uh, first two fronts. Is Jewish conscience to fight the Nazi, the Nazi Zionists everywhere. And it, it's gaining momentum across the mm. world mm. and good kudos to all uh, progressive Jews. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's the, uh, that's the uh, finishing note that I think we can end on for today and looking forward to uh, your next presentation. Thank you, Ahmed. Okay. And now um, we're going to bring this to a conversation between Dr. Weisfeld and Steve Struggle from the original Black Panther Party. Uh, we, this one came out on March 30th, 2024. Here we are. And uh, here we are in uh, Ramadan as well. i am uh, been fasting for three weeks now and I'm spaced out and uh, I'm gonna be slower than usual. Okay. But the That's genocide right. is continuing and they couldn't care less, you know, that the uh, International Court of Justice has, no, it was the Security Council that asked for a uh, a truce during Ramadan, and the Zionists couldn't care less. So what, so what exactly happened? Well, they're preparing to uh, occupy the Rafa region, which is the last uh, region that has not been occupied by the uh, invasion of Gaza. And uh, I think their intention is to round up uh, all the military-aged uh, men, isolate them. There's photos now that I've been posting on Facebook uh, showing how they're bound and uh, stripped of their outer clothing and with a number, you know, written on their back. And uh, they're held there as captives, you know, even though they're civilians. And uh, their intention is to... Uh, separate the uh, military age men, you know, from the uh, general population so they cannot become, they cannot become fighters. They cannot, uh, you know, become, uh, you know, f fighters for Hamas. You know, Hamas has lost, you know, according to the, uh, the Zionist regime, 6,000 fighters. And uh, their initial estimate of uh, Hamas uh, having a, uh, um, a military uh, force of uh, 30,000 has now been revised to be 40,000. And uh, they haven't even counted the uh, the Palestinians who are now joining Hamas in order to fight against the occupation. So their intention is to try to get rid of this fighting force and to reduce the population to uh, uh, to captives, basically. And uh, well, uh, they want to, you know, uh, expel the uh, Hamas. They want the Hamas, you know, fighters to surrender and then be expelled into uh, some sort of prison camp in Egypt that's being set up, you know, by the uh, Egyptian regime. That's what it seems as uh, is this, this is what it's coming down to. You're saying the Egyptians are collaborating with the Israeli to set up a prison? Yeah. They're setting up a uh, an area in Egypt across the border from Rafa, right. in Egyptian Rafa. They brought in these concrete slabs, you know, like like what the Zionists use, you know, to set up the um, apartheid wall. They're setting up, you know, a, a confined area surrounded by these cement 
uh, cement stru structures, walls, right. Right. to yeah. contain the uh, Hamas fighters who are supposed to uh, surrender, you know, and be transferred into uh, Egypt for that purpose. However, I would not recommend this kind of surrender. I'd rather, I'd rather die fighting than surrender because what happened in uh, Beirut in 1982 is that with the occupation of uh, West Beirut by um, Israeli General Sharon, and then they uh, 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 forced the surrender of the 5,000 uh, PLO fighters who were then transferred into Tunisia. So they saved themselves, but uh, what happened is that he, in spite of the fact that the United States had um, guaranteed the security of the Palestinian refugees who were unarmed, in particular in Sabra Shatila refugee camps in Beirut, the United States did nothing. Israel uh, surrounded the place and uh, sent in their trained uh, phalangist fighters, fascist fighters, uh, Christian fascist uh, crusader fighters that were trained by the Mossad. They were sent into the refugee camps to uh, massacre all the population, all, all the population, everyone. And that was 3,000 who were killed inside the refugee camps of Sabra Shatila. And then the men who were separated and sent to a, a you know, um, a soccer stadium somewhere, you know, they were all killed, all killed as well. And uh, so it's, you know, from three to 5,000 uh, Palestinian refugees were killed in that way because the PLO fighters, you know, were sent away to Tunisia and uh, together with the leadership, together with Arafat. Uh, and so, you know, this cannot be repeated again. And the, and the and Hamas knows this, you know, they will not surrender because it only means death for the civilians. So Interesting. Interesting. Well. Yeah. But the Palestinians are willing to fight to death because they know they have no other choice. You know, and the Palestinian civilians, they're not willing to leave Gaza, even to save their lives. You know, they're not willing to leave, say, except for the most desperate, I suppose, because they don't want to end up, you know, like the five million Palestinian refugees are still surviving in refugee camps, you know, spread out over the region or now are being cut off, you know, from uh united nations refugee relief uh, organization you know the united states has now decided in the latest piece of legislation to permanently cut off funding for unra so they're permanently cutting off funding for palestinian refugees and what are the palestinian refugees supposed to do well that's not mentioned in the legislation never never mentioned yeah. this, th this concerns me because with the shift back but they shifted the world's attention back to the Russia because of the terrorist bombing there two weekends ago. Now the struggle in Western Asia is not getting the media focus that it was it was getting. Yeah. Um, and therefore, many people don't know what you just shared, this plan to basically um, force Palestinians into an Egyptian an Egyptian. Uh, uh, enclave to possibly later be killed, which is kind of that's that isn't a good option. Um, but I'm reading other things though about the Palestinians actually winning. I and that the and that Israel has not invaded Rafa for some political reasons. Um, the West, some Western countries, the United States is under great pressure from this country. There's a lot of pressure being put on the Biden administration to cut the cut this nonsense and to um, stop Israel from carrying out any more attacks on the Palestinians. There haven't been major major demonstrations here in a while. However, the I want I want to say the majority of Americans do not like what they're seeing. Uh, the ones who like it are are a minority. And yes, by, you're right. Yeah, the latest and, poll indicated 55% were opposed to this uh, yeah, war. Yeah. So I, I, I mentioned to a person this week, a, a matter of fact, Thursday evening, a conversation. I kept saying, 
the issue of Palestine must come up in every debate, every speech, every every time the presidential campaign um, turn, shows up, the issue of Palestine must be front and center the most important issue. And here's why. Eventually, gas prices will go down. They will. Eventually, some domestic problems will, 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 will be resolved with either Biden or Trump. But the Palestinian question, the entire world knows that that question, the resolution of that question lies in the United States. It doesn't rely with Israel. It relies with the United States. So the United States people involved in these elections have to make this a central campaign. Mm. And, I'm, and you know, whoever, whatever candidate is running, whatever they have a debate, whatever people have a chance to weigh in, the first thing, Palestinian right to self-determination. What are we doing about it? I'm not talking about October 7. It's much more than that. I think that is imperative to keep that issue on the front burner because if it's put on the back burner, it's over. Mm. If, yeah, I think uh, I think I think if, if it's on the front burner, we will do a great support for our brothers yeah. and sisters in Palestine. We have yeah. to do. That. We we really yeah. don't have any choice. Yeah, it's like uh, every every revolutionary movement depends upon the success of the Palestinians in warding off this uh, fascist yes. invasion. Yes, everything yes. depends yes. on this. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it is it is crucial because mm. everybody has seen the naked genocide, the mm. naked brutality, the naked destruction of Israel with firm U.S. backing and assistance. So yeah. for that to be forgotten or put in the back burner or be to be dismissed would, would be a great defeat for social justice worldwide. Oh, yes. Because if they get away with this genocide in Gaza... They'll do it to any other revolutionary experience any, anywhere any else other, in the world. Any, anywhere else in the world. That's right. Yeah. Including New York, Atlanta, yeah. no yeah. matter where. You know. Well, Atlanta, Atlanta, you know, has been a hotbed. Uh, there's been one activist murdered by the uh, police a few months ago uh, regarding this, the struggle against Cop City, a yeah. a privately funded police training center. They have dozens of people under under indictment for racketeering and uh, running a racketeering influence corrupt organization, RICO, a, a, a law that was passed to fight the mob. They have, I want to say 60 activists, 60, 60, 60, 60 in Atlanta have been arrested on RICO charges. So they mm -hmm. are fighting back in Atlanta. They are. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the centers right now of mm -hmm. this movement. To, uh, to 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 uh, criminalize dissent is in Atlanta under under a black mayor. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yes. You know, I've read about the cop city, and it seems like that they're training the cops to be a uh, a, a military force to attack and carry out pogroms in the black ghettos of America. Well, they, 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 there was a story recently from Mississippi um, in Rankin County. I think last year, two, two, two black men were sexually assaulted, physically assaulted, and um, bound and gagged by a group of white policemen in Rankin County, Mississippi, along this same line. There was some claim that a white woman was being held hostage in a home or something, the police kicked in the door, raided the house, and just abused the men in some ways that I don't even want to discuss on 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 this show. Mm -hmm. It was just the tip of the iceberg. The police chief has refused to resign. Mm -hmm. There were convictions. There were convictions brought on all charges. And what I'm saying is, this happened in the light of the George Floyd protests. Mm -hmm. There have been some people saying the George Floyd protests were not successful. I disagree. We wouldn't expect the George Floyd protests to end police brutality, will we? No. The George Floyd protests could not end police brutality. But what it brought was the reckoning of large numbers of people who were against cop terror to put it to 
to let the state and the police know you're you are being watched and if and and, and if and when you get out of hand, we might not win, but 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 we will fight back. So mm-hmm. I consider that a victory. Five policemen were sentenced to up up to twenty five years in prison for wow. assaulting these two uh, African American men around between twenty eight and forty five years old. They were viciously assaulted, just for no reason. Twenty five years, good. That's good. Well, you know, yeah, I, I I'm looking so. forward to the reception committee inside the prison as well. Me too. Yes. So yeah. am I. You know, um, 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 Derek Chauvin, you know, met his committee there. He should have, didn't he? Yeah. He should have. Yeah. Well, what what can save the Palestinians? You know, this is, uh, I'm drawing a blank. You know, millions of people demonstrating. Okay, so they've forced the United States, you know, to abstain in the vote in the Security Council and then claim afterwards that it's non-binding because they abstained <laughs> doesn't apply to them because they abstained you know what about majority rule <laughs> you know like what about you know legal procedure you know like nothing of that nature counts anymore no okay. it apply to them no no yeah I, I i i do think the question has to be asked because we're at a point now where we've had many of the people in the streets the Israeli occupation is continuing and and, and is widening, hmm. and uh, we do have to continue to to evolve our movement with strategies and tactics that have the goal of Palestinian self determination. Hmm. Uh, I, I I know it, it has to be a conversation that invo- involves more than more than more than us as two people. But I think you're right. We do need to consider what's occurred. What progress has it made? What issues still res- are resolving? Or what issues still need to be resolved? And what are we and and what are we going to do about it? I totally agree. Hmm. I, yeah. Uh, in the here and now, uh, this week with uh, Ahmed, he mentioned uh, He was uh, speaking in a very uh, pessimistic way, but in a very steadfast way as well. And uh, the Palestinians are not going to give up. Now, what he mentioned that was very interesting and new was that he considered this to be a three-front war. Okay. Okay. First of all, Hamas fighters are fighting back. And they're relatively successful, you know, like they've taken out, you know, even, you know, the Zionist regime admits that they've lost uh, 253 soldiers. That's, you know, that's uh, pretty incredible. Killed soldiers. And and then there's all the injured soldiers as well. Okay. So, which is probably three times as much. But in any case, 253 is what they admit. But they don't include October the 7th. On October the 7th, there was another 253 that were killed, you know, who were there, you know, in the military camps around Gaza, surrounding Gaza, and they were taken out in the first hour of the offensive by the 1,200 Hamas fighters. You know, like, those are the ones, you know, who were sniping, you know, the civilians who were demonstrating, you know, in the Great March of Return two years ago. Right. Right. Those were the murderous, you know, uh, Israelis, you know, who were, you know, set, you know, to encircle the the Gazans and to take them down, you know, if they came anywhere, you know, close to the fence. So, you know, like, and they killed 350, you know, uh, civilians at that time. So, yeah. Anywhere close to the fence, just close. Yeah. Just close. Yeah. Yeah, Unarmed, you know, civilians, you know, just wanting to come, go back, you know, to where their grandparents had lived before, you know, that's all, you know. They, you know, they would have even, you know, shared the kibbutzim, you know, with the Israelis, you know, if they were given the opportunity, probably, you know, anything's better than Gaza. But yeah. no, they were just taken down, including that nurse. Wow. Uh, so, Incredible. okay, that's the first front. Okay. And it is holding steady. Okay. Right. Now, the second front is Lebanon. Right. And there, you know, Hezbollah is taking on the whole Zionist military and they're afraid to invade Lebanon like they did before, you know, because they would be, they would be, you know, like decimated there by Hezbollah. And, uh, and so that's the second front. And it's, you know, uh, it's uh, having a relative success, you know, in 
uh, taking out the military outposts uh, on the border with Lebanon and taking out the settlements there, the colonies, you know, that have been placed on the border area as well in order to claim that territory, you know, for the Zionist state. Okay. And, and 125,000 uh, settlers, Israeli settlers who were living there before, have not gone back because they can't. You know, part of their, you know, uh, their uh, villages have been destroyed, you know, by the missiles, you know, like sophisticated missiles, not, you know, the uh, sugar and, and uh, fertilizer, you know, uh, mortars, you know, of Hamas. No, these are real missiles. And they have missiles, you know, that are even bigger, that can go anywhere, you know, Tel Aviv, anywhere, you know, like in the whole of the uh, of Palestine. So that's the second front. Okay. And what Ahmad said, you know, that really, you know, surprised and encouraged me, he considered the third front to be the internal front of the Jewish opposition against the Zionist leadership inside the Jewish community and from within the Jewish community. And then he was talking about, you know, the Jewish blend vigil as well that I conduct on Sundays tomorrow at the Jewish community campus here in Montreal. And there should be uh, such vigils everywhere, wherever there's a you know, the uh, Jewish center, you know, it, there should be a picket line there, an informational picket line to uh, educate the Jewish people going in there to tell them that they shouldn't be afraid to oppose fascism. And this is what they're faced with. Not only the Palestinians are being faced with fascism, it's the Jewish people are being faced with fascism. You know, the Zionist government, you know, of Netanyahu, you know, you know, they claim to be a democratic dictatorship, okay? <laughs> you know, so uh, they get the democracy. Where do they get the democratic part from? You know, even though it's, you know, like blatant contradiction, you know, but where do they get the democratic part from? Because they're elected by the citizens, you know, of uh, of the of the Zionist state, you know, who are citizens there, the, you know, with 20%, you know, who are Palestinians as well, who are citizens, but they get their mandate, you know, from the 80%, you know, who are Jewish there. Well, they don't even have that, you know, because those uh, fascists who are in the war cabinet, they have only, you know, like seven or nine seats, you know, in the whole parliament of the Knesset there. You know, where do they get, you know, to claim that there's some kind of a majority? And even if that government was initially elected by a majority, it's only a minority of the Jewish people who have a vote in those elections. You know, they don't speak for the Jewish people. Majority of the Jewish people do not have a vote in the Israel elections. We have nothing to do with that government. And there are 7.4 million Jewish Americans, and there's only 7.2 Jewish Israelis. And of those, you know, a lot of left, a lot of left, you know, maybe a million have left to go to where? California, Miami, Berlin. For mm -hmm. sure, they don't want to stick around there. They don't want to be forced in the military. They're draft dodgers, basically is what they are. They're not mentioned as such, you know, because that would be an embarrassment, you know, to the Zionist movement. Right. right. That Jewish people don't want to fight for the Zionist project. And now they're so desperate that they're trying to force the Orthodox yeshiva students into the military to fight for the Zionists. And then they claim, you know, that 20% uh, of, of the uh, ultra-Orthodox are not studying hard enough that they're not doing full-time studies in the yeshiva, and therefore they should be pulled out and put into the military. <laughs> wow. You know? Yeah. Wow. I mean, how do they know, first of all, you know, that these students are not studying hard enough? You know, <laughs> they're not in there. They're not in the yeshivas. And second of all, the, uh, the ultra-Orthodox, you know, they're demonstrating. They're blocking the streets. They're getting beaten by the police. They're being dragged away. Everything is happening to them. And uh, they will not go into the military. There's a few who have gone, you know, because of the privileges involved. But they are irrelevant, you know, the vast majority of the ultra-Orthodox will not go and fight for the Zionist regime. They're not Zionists. Even though, you know, their political representatives, you know, are part of the, uh, a part of the Zionist government, you know, that is conducting this genocide right now. Oh, so. Question is, how effective can the Jewish opposition be in taking on the Zionist leadership? Actually, I, very I, effective. I, very I, effective. I, I'm so surprised. I, yeah, you know, very, yeah, very the anti-Zionist Jewish organizations like uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and If Not Now, uh, they have forced uh, the, like, J Street and uh, the other, you know, uh, uh, um, what is it, uh, um, 
for peace, uh, something for peace. Uh, yeah, th those two big organizations that have, you know, like a mass membership, right. they have come out in support of who? Chuck Schumer, who just called for the downfall of the Netanyahu government, <laughs> which is basically calling for a revolution against the Zionist regime there. <laughs> it's not worded as such, but that's what it is. And that's what it's how it's treated as, you know, by the Zionist, you know, ideologues who are denouncing Chuck yeah. Schumer for speaking out at a time when all Jewish people have to support, you know, the Zionist government because it's a time of war and you're not allowed to criticize the Zionist government because it's wartime. And they're defending the Jewish people, supposedly. This is the, you know, dogma that's that's fed to everybody. It now sure he's is. broken that. It's gone. You know, that whole sort of, you know, uh, 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 prohibition of dissent. Uh, by Jewish people against the Zionist regime, it's gone. It's blown away. And then it was followed by the abstention of the United States government, which means nothing, but, you know, it's still, they wouldn't have done it otherwise if there wasn't the pressure being put on them. So. That's right. You're right. Brother. You're right. I mean, all, all the points you're, all the points you're making are leading to the inevitable victory for the Palestinians. The question is, how long how much longer will this go on? I would say decades, if not centuries, that's my opinion. And how can we make sure that those of us who are not in Israel are who are not in Palestine, who are not fighters there, how can we how can we be sure to build a movement that will support them from this point on? We yeah. will overcome the Zionists. Yes, I know that for sure, because you know, when I speak with the uh, the, the Jewish people, you know who have been indoctrinated by television news, uh, you know, on the vigil, there's a change happening. And uh, they are beginning to realize, you know, that there's something going on here that they don't want, but they still feel compelled to go along with it for the time being. But they will not allow it to continue. Now, the question is at what cost to the Palestinians? Yes. At what cost of the Palestinians? You know, if we look back at other revolutionary struggles, you know, in Vietnam, you know, uh, I've read accounts that it was 1.3 million or perhaps up to 3 million Vietnamese who, were, who died, you know, during those wars, you know, both the French and the American wars uh, of uh, counter-revolution in, in Vietnam. And they won. They wouldn't give up. Even, you know, when the first two offensives, you know, took place and there was a, a mass loss of, you know, Vietnamese fighters. Nonetheless, they carried off a third offensive, which was successful. And that was, Tr you know, General Tran, who organized right. those right. three uh, offensives. And he didn't have the full support of the entire, you know, Politburo, you know, of the Vietnamese Communist Party. It was, you know, a very iffy thing there, you know, because they were, uh, they were beginning to back down. But uh, yes. but uh, but they persevered, you know, the steadfastness, you know, which is so important for the Palestinians, you know, like worked for the Vietnamese. Then let's take on, on the uh, the example of Algeria. During the French occupation, the France occupation of Algeria, there were millions who were lost there too. They were genocidal. They were wiping out, you know, uh, anybody and everybody who they thought, you know, might be a source of revolutionary. Uh, action in Algeria and they lost uh from what I remember up to three million Algerians you know were killed by France and France has never apologized never done any sort of compensation has never right. done anything you know to make up for that as well but there in in Algeria you know they were able to overcome the uh, fr uh, France occupation and the uh the French colonials uh, citizens who were there and taking advantage and, and, and uh, enjoying the privileges, you know, of colonial rule, they left. They went back to France, okay? And they tried to wow. carry out a, a, a coup d'etat against General de Gaulle, who was initially a rightist, you know, but he realized, you know, that they could not win there. And he pulled out of Algeria. And because of that, the French colonials who were the, the super fascists, you know, you know, thought of, you know, assassinating and even, you know, carrying out a coup d'etat against, you know, General de Gaulle, who was the president at the time, but they failed, okay? But the problem here is even more intransigible because the uh, the Jewish Israelis 
don't have you know double citizenship except for 17 percent wow and wow. uh you know, 70 percent you have citizenship from either the united states or england or france or uh, or whatever you know and they could leave but those are the ones who are the most fanatic <laughs> you know like so they you know they they're there you know because they want you know the colonial privileges that go along you know with their rule and so they will not leave easily but that's only 17 percent in any case the rest don't have anywhere to go so in the united states is is not going to accept five five million Jewish Israelis nope, who have given up happen. on Zionism. Will you know? not happen. Will not happen. Nope. Will not happen. You know, you know, they, they wouldn't even let Jewish, you know, refugees in after the Holocaust. You know, never mind. You know, yeah. At this I'm, point here, I'm sorry, so, I mean, but but if they do show up, my friend, I guarantee you, they'll give them citizenship as quick as they can. They become citizens as quick as possible. Hmm. Yes, they will because they'll they'll keep them being old egg. Hmm. So, how to deal with the uh, the Zionist movement is again by the internal Jewish revolution against the Zionist parties, and this yes. has to happen not only here in the United States, it also has to happen inside of Palestine. There has to be an overthrow of all those political parties, including the Labour Party, <laughs> the Zionist Labour Party, you know, which is a member of the Second International still including the PLO, you know, the Zionist Labour Party has got to go. It has to be expelled from the Second International. Israel has to be expelled from the United Nations General Assembly. There has to be a general overturning of the Zionist power base within the Jewish community and internationally in the United Nations and elsewhere. And sanctions, they have to be you know, totally isolated, both diplomatically, economically. And then, you know, there's also the addition of the Yemen offensive against the Zionist regime. Yes, again, the hidden story again. The hidden story. Yeah. The hidden well, story. but I feel, I feel not only sort of wasted, you know, because of fasting, I feel so weak, you know, politically. Because when I go there on the, on the vigil, you know, last week, there was one, you know, Jewish anarchist guy, Max, the bookseller, came by, you know, had a few things to say, and then left, you know, like he couldn't think, you know, it's inconceivable for him to stay there, you know, and keep the vigil going together with me, you know? Yes, it is. It is. And then the other, you know, like a Jewish anarchist, you know, lives in the area, Leslie. I will denounce him here and now, you know, like Leslie, you know, he only showed up once and he hasn't shown up again. And then the others, you know, the other Jewish uh, radicals, you know, like who are assimilationists who never identified as being Jewish before. All of a sudden, discover that they're Jewish, you know, because it works, you know, to get some attention, you know, when they denounce the Zionism. Okay, fine, but you know, when it comes to sort of, you know, dealing with and educating the Jewish community, no, right. nothing. You know, they treat the Jewish community as if they're you know, equivalent to the you know, soldiers, you know, in Gaza, which they are not. One, they didn't have a vote, yeah, no, never yeah, voted for the government. Two, yeah. they don't go and you know, they're not soldiers. They don't go there, you know, to fight. And the few who have gone, you know, I haven't even heard anything of them, you know, because I think there's so few. In France, you know, uh, they have a lot of, you know, like uh, French Jewish citizens who go there to fight, you know, in Gaza. Right, 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 right. I remember. But South yeah. Africa, you know, the Jewish South Africans who come back, you know, they get arrested, <laughs> you know, because they're criminals. You know, that's what happens to you know, real criminals like that. Put them in jail. Yeah. I'm telling you, so they won't go back jail. again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We want to, we need to put them in jail. I agree. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot for us to do, my friends. There's a lot. There's a lot for us left to do, but we have to be steadfast and continue to struggle because our brothers, and sisters, our people in Palestine need our support. Period. That's it. Yeah. It, it, so it, I have it. to issue an appeal here, you know, to to other Jewish people, you know, here to share this video, the one with Ahmad as well, to tell other Jewish people that they have to sort of, you know, step up. This is the time for them to step up. Otherwise they will be denounced, you know, forever. And their children will be denouncing them forever as well. Well said. Now's the time to step up. Now's the time. Now's yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back tomorrow. But, uh... Keep the camera on. 
Yeah, the camera has to be on all the time, you know, because I, I, I'm getting attacked. All the time, all the time. I'm not only getting attacked, you know, by, you know, the young women and, and middle-aged women coming up and shouting at me, you know, like shouting into my face, you know, like you can see it all there. There's also the, the men who come to attack. Last time, you know, that I got in, there was an attack, you know, some guy who was supporting genocide, basically. And so I got pissed off with him. And so he came and tried to rip off, you know, the painting that I have up on the lamppost, the one that says, you know, one Holocaust does not justify yes. another. Yes. He damaged it a bit, you know, but he didn't tear it. And I fixed it up and I'm going to be putting it back up, but higher. Because it's All the second right. time that that painting got attacked. They cannot take that. They cannot take it, you know, because they realize, you know, when one says, you know, one Holocaust does not justify another, that they're doing something that they will condemn themselves. They condemn the Holocaust, and yet they're committing another Holocaust. And they cannot be, you know, uh, told that they are doing it, you know, because they're too neurotic, you know, a psychotic, neurotic, you know, mentality that these that these Zionists have is just incredible. So. Yeah you know, has to be defended against. And that's the second time, you know, I, I had to use, you know, the bamboo pole, you know, holding up the banner to ward off this guy. Wow. So, you know, uh, he had to let go of the, of the painting when I, uh, uh, when I basically, you know, uh, took a, took a swipe at him with the, with a bamboo pole, but, uh, uh, but uh, he grabbed hold of the pole and I had to sort of, you know, uh, Got to get it released, you know, and he, and he had an advantage on me there, you know, but he still had to back off. And, uh, so that was, uh, that was uh, successful enough, but, uh, that, that, it's going to happen that. again, you know, and I'm going to fight him off again. You know, that's, that's it. That's all. That's all we can do. Well, and then in court, you know, I'm going back with a constitutional challenge, you know, saying that this is a violation of freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, you know, so, and I think we can win that in court. And once I win that in court, whoa. What that what means is that I can go inside the building. <laughs> I'll be able to go inside to any meeting. I can speak. I'll be able to ask questions. I'll be able to do all of that once I get, you know, acquitted in court. And then they will not be able to stop me. And no, then we're going to see, right. you know, something happening. You know, something's going to happen in Jewish community so because of this, this mini school initiative, you know, like it's going to crack the whole thing open. Yeah. Well, Okay. Okay, we don't have much time left in this session, but I think we've covered all the important points. I think we so continue. Too. I really do. We continue. Okay, but what what is the USA going to do? This is the crucial thing, you know. And the they USA, can stop the genocide just like that. Well, no, the USA. If the if the American, I hate to say this, but if Americans continue to protest and weigh in. At the ballot box against Biden during, during the primaries, he will have to he will have to change his views. He'll, he'll yeah. have he'll have to enforce a ceasefire because if he yeah. doesn't, because if he doesn't, my prediction is he will lose. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's on the way to losing. Yeah, I think He's so. On the way to losing. He's on the way to losing. And but I think that uh, Trump can also you know uh, be a loser too. You know because. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Cornell West, if he gets 4%, and if uh, Dr. Jill Stein gets another 4%, I mean, even if they don't make the 5%, you know, where they get funding for the next election, you know, 8%, you know, off, that means that neither of those candidates are going to get a majority, you know, neither Biden yeah, nor yeah, Trump this, are going to get a majority. Yeah, which was, maybe, you know, this, this, this uh, maybe the election, you know right? yeah, so then, you know, like all of a sudden the government, you know, like becomes, uh, uh, loses its credibility. And and the other the opposing party, you know, can say, you know, we don't have to respect that government because they don't have a majority, you know, whoever wins, you know. Right. So the whole thing falls apart, you know, the whole sort of, you know, like charade of democracy, you know, which is not democracy, is gonna come apart. That's what I think is gonna happen. That's what I'm hoping for. You know, the third party candidates, you know, are playing a very important role here. Very, 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 very important role. But it's they're not perceived as important right now. Hmm. They're not. The body politics is only Democrats and Republicans are important, and that's and that's that's something that hopefully this election might change. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. Okay. Looking forward to the next poll results. And see how right. much you know the opposition you know garners there, and we got two opposition initiatives. You know, both of them credible. It's magnificent. Something's you know is gonna gonna change you know in the United States. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Looking forward to next week. Speaking with you, you Steve. Thank Great. you. Here and now. And now we're going to go to another video with Abraham Weisfeld, PhD, chairman of the Revolution for Bundism, and Steve Struggle, a Black Panther from the original Black Panther Party. This one came out on April 6, 2024. Here we are. This is here now. And uh, we have uh, too much to talk about. This is the incredible conditions that we're being subjected to now. I hear that there's uh, been negotiations between Iran and the United States even to uh, make a deal. <laughs> so Iran is going to retaliate against the uh, attack on its consular offices in ba Damascus. So they've agreed not to attack uh, U.S. facilities, and U.S. is not going to complain when it attacks uh, Israel's facilities. <laughs> what kind of a deal is that? Bizarre. Well, uh, Abraham, I, I, I want let me start again. I hold everybody who's watching the program. Thank you for thank you for being here with us. Please uh, like, subscribe, and share our. Uh, broadcast with others. We can increase our number of people watching and um, please send us your comments. Now, Abraham, I thought this was going to happen. Not necessarily a negotiation between what would it would not be struck. But the United States has released a lot of money to Iran. The United States has asked Iran to do things under behind closed doors or using back channels. So it doesn't surprise me that Iran and the United States has some negotiations after their embassy was attacked, because that's what they do. Um, I did not know about this agreement, um, but it, is, it doesn't surprise me because, you know, um, the U.S., there are people in the U.S. who want to attack Iran. The U.S. can't attack Iran and win a war. Um, and I think the U.S., all it cares about is it, well, I can't say all it cares about is its people and its facilities, but it doesn't, I'm not surprised to hear, I guess I am surprised to hear it openly being discussed, but it would not surprise me if they were having discussions because bombing of an embassy is an act of war. There's no two ways about it. Israel knew that when it did it, it knew exactly what it did and why it did it. And Tehran has not responded to any really serious way to the other provocations Israel has carried out and attacks on its people, even using the so-called ISIS-K to attack a, um, a meeting in Iran uh, late, I think early, late last year, which was in honor of General, General Soleimani. Right. So, I mean, I'm not surprised that they're negotiating something because they have, they have to, they have to, they have to counterattack. It's like when, when is when it, when, when Al Qaeda attacked the United States, the United States had to attack something. Yeah. They, they couldn't just say, "Oh well, it's okay." No, they weren't yeah. like that. So, you know, I I'm curious to see what Iran does because Iran may not attack anything anytime soon. Hmm. Who knows? Who knows? But it, it, it doesn't surprise me though those negotiations go on because in in the world of diplomacy, you know, between countries, it goes on all the time. Yeah, I guess they've been talking a lot, you know, because there seems to be, you know, quite a delay in the response from Iran, which is not favorable to Iran. Iran is uh, doing itself a disservice by not responding immediately because that merely encourages Israel to continue an attack of the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard, you know, in uh, Syria and Ira Iraq. Uh, okay. It may turn out to be, you know, uh, an attack upon the Golan Heights that are occupied since 1967 by the Zionist state could be there. Or or it could be that they have selected some high-ranking Israeli officials to 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 um count out. Take out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be the uh that would that be the uh reciprocal manner of responding. The appropriate, yeah. the appropriate response would be find seven high-ranking Israeli military officials. Or maybe um, Shin Bet, um, Mossad, someone who is in in the in in the structure that they know where they are. 
they know how to who how to attack them and to avoid problems with their allies they'll have to have the attack occur in israel hmm. I, I can't see iran attacking let's say uh uh an underground mossad base or unless syria approves it let's say they fired an underground mossad um general in lebanon or hmm. in syria or you know where they have an an, an ally or, mm-hmm. where, or where they want to have good relations, I can't mm-hmm. see them. I can't see them countering on foreign on quote unquote foreign soil. It would have to be in in Israel, in my opinion. Just just to make sure everything diplomatically mm-hmm. goes okay, mm-hmm. because you know they you know they don't want to have any other problems. Mm-hmm. And the U.S. I don't know, this is interesting, you're right? Because to openly discuss this as a, prior to it occurring, you're right, does take away the element of, of surprise and, 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 and it gives targets a chance to hide. Mm. Right? I mean, yeah. the, targets, the targets because if it's going to be somebody hiding high, high in the government or in the military, they can go into their bunkers for a couple of weeks and, you know, you know, you know what I'm saying, just, you know, I don't know. We'll see. Mm. Yeah. We'll see, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll see if, if, if anything happens at all right now. You know, mm-hmm. nothing might happen right? because the fact to have this open, like you said, openly being discussed in the press, is kind of un unprecedented in my opinion. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, Ramadan Karim. Uh, I'm still fasting. I've made it this long, and I'm going to make it to the end of the Ramadan. It certainly is. Uh, wow. Oh, it's what based a out, you know, like my mind is somewhere, you know, like halfway. Month. Here and halfway there. What a month! All the Muslims in the world have had, have 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 endured with the, with the United States and Israel's assault on the people of Gaza. What mm-hmm. a month! What a month! Yeah. With, with Israel bombing bombing the, a, um, and murdering Iranian officials in Syria. What a month this has been! Yeah, and they've attacked during Ramadan, you know, which is like a big right, no-no. Right. Dur- during Ramadan, right? During Ramadan, yeah. this attacks have occurred. Yes. Yeah, maybe, you know, Iran is, you know, holding off, you know, because of Ramadan, you know, it'll wait until the end of the month of Ramadan and then it'll come into a, a big offensive. Uh, could be, you know, something like that as well. Yeah? It's very, very true. As a matter of fact, that might be a culturally responsive way to handle it as well. Yeah. Hmm. We'll see. Oh, my. The, but world, it's, the, world, it's... the world is watching. The world is watching. What's going to happen now? What's going on now? Yeah. Really, everything is changing, you know, like like from day to day, you know, like it's incredible. The United States has uh, distanced itself from uh, Israel now, both in the uh, Security Council, where it is announced that it is opposed to uh, Israel's practice in Gaza, and uh, without referring to the word genocide. And the uh, United States is giving... Uh, uh, green light, you know, to Iran to retaliate against Israel as well. Uh, yeah, that, and, no, uh, that, that, that that is that is unprecedented. I have to agree. Yeah, but really. the embassy is unprecedented as well. And yeah. uh, any any country, even I don't like the country, has a will have the diplomatic right to respond. It's just the yeah. way that shit goes. Okay, I, mean, yeah. I don't like the country. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, you know, like uh, it's it's so important, you know, for uh, listeners to realize, you know, that what we're discussing here, you know, is not discussed anywhere else. We're discussing here revolutionary world strategy, basically. Thank and you. and uh, you know, this is you know a wonderful thing to be able to do, you know, together in the, with you, Steve, in this dialogue. And uh, you know, one has to take note, you know, that the other sort of uh, channels that are available and that are very well. Uh, paid attention to uh, are only uh, doing journalism, you know, and we're not doing journalism. We know what was going on. Right. right. And we, you know, leave that to others, you know, to take care of that, you know, area of work and to bring us, you know, the, the information that is being censored elsewhere. But we're discussing here how to take on the world's superpower, the biggest superpower in human history, and to defeat it. Just like we did, you know, around the war in Vietnam. There, you, go. there yeah. you know, like we stopped them in their tracks. You know, you know, even Nixon, you know, had to sort of, you know, play play good, you know, to 
pretend that he was, you know, withdrawing from Vietnam, you know, uh, just giving support to the uh, puppet regime in the in Saigon, and and then you know ended it, you know, conscription because otherwise he would have been uh, thrown out of the office physically, <laughs> you know. So uh, that's happening again. You know, the United States has had to back down. Incredible, you know, yeah, and, you know and so is, quickly too. Yeah, these are very important points. I hope that everyone is is noticing because in the in the journalistic approach to covering the crisis, a lot of exposés will be a lot of exposés will be uh, made. A lot of um, hidden facts will be exposed, and that's very important. But we want to put forth an analysis which is a guide to action to defeat imperialism to bring victory to the Palestinian people and all the oppressed. That's mm -hmm. the purpose of, of a dialogue like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, the hardcore who listens to us are the ones who are going to uh, be able to educate others for sure. But, uh, you know, the time is now for revolutionary theory. This is not, you know, something that uh, is... Uh, uh, I was trying to think of an expression, uh, if, uh, something that's, you know, like uh, flying in the sky, you know, like just for fun. No, we're discussing the ongoing world revolution that is happening. It's happening with Iran, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Gaza. And we, we, we have to really, we have to really um, show solidarity to the people of Yemen. Yes, Yemen, Donetsk, yeah. Lugansk, yeah. as well. Yeah. Right. Donetsk, Lugansk. All exactly. revolutionary peoples who are who right. are, are on their own, you know, like uh, taking the assault, you know, against the the regimes, you know, that are trying to true. control them. Very true. Very true. And then we uh, have Africa. Africa has joined in, you know, like Ikawat, you know, in fact, you know, has been taken over, you know, and now with the election of this new prime minister president in Senegal. You know, it's going to be changed completely. It's going to be changed, you know, from being kind of revolutionary force to becoming a revolutionary force. And the African Union is going to have to follow suite as well. Yeah, the African Union is going to have, there, there's going to have to be demand from the African working class, the masses, those and those inside the military. This this has got to change. Mm -hmm. We can't we can't allow, AFRICOM has to be re removed from the continent. Yeah. That has to be the goal. They may not want to make it, they may not want to make it and 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 ex and ex explicit goal, but there should, should be no U.S. troops on on African territory. What's they 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 serve the same purpose as the French troops. And yeah. if, if France is on the way out, then we have to we have to support, encourage, and show solidarity with those African the African people to get U.S. troops off their soil as well. Yeah, Mali got rid of the French troops, and now they're going to. Uh force the American troops to leave as well. There's American troops there too, yeah. There you go, exactly. Yeah, uh-huh. Zimbabwe has uh, dumped the American dollar that it was using, you know, for practical purposes, and has now developed its own zig. Zimbabwe gold, uh, because they got a lot of gold, you know, they've been mining it, you know, they've been keeping it for themselves. They haven't let, you know, the looters come in and take, take it out, you know. This is a completely different situation there as well. South Africa is still continuing, charging the United States with complicity with the genocide in Gaza. Okay. Wow. It's all happening at the same time. And everybody is, you know, cluing in and deciding, you know, this is the time to move. Because, you know, like when others do, you know, like you do too. Interesting. This is the time to move. Okay. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I have to say, Abraham, I, I mentioned to others that um, I'm trying to handle this world food world food kitchen on a correct note. As I understand it, and my understanding may be wrong, the world food kitchen was the U.S. or some attempt to displace UNRWA in Israel. Hmm. That could be wrong, but that's what I have come to understand. So for them to, when they were in Israel, handling, I mean, excuse me, in Palestine, delivering food, which is nothing wrong delivering food, as I understand it, they were in the service of U.S. imperialism, yeah. as far as the attempt to get rid of, and 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 the, and the Israeli government, who has always hated UNRWA. 
Okay. Um, when when the when the relief workers were murdered, not just killed, murdered. I I, I want to use the correct term. Hmm. Uh, because they were murdered. They weren't just killed. They were murdered, uh, gunned down, and um, they came from Western countries. I still think if they would have been Egyptian, Omani, Saudi, uh, UAE, no one would have given a damn. Jordanian, Syrian, they wouldn't have cared. Hmm. The fact that they were from Western countries is what made the difference. And I want people, I think that's important to realize that is what caused the outroar, not the murders themselves. Mm -hmm. That's my view. I could be wrong, but I stand on it because within less than a week, now I'm not sure if the if, if the people who were dismissed were fired, are they going to be prosecuted? Mm. Are there going to be civil trials, pay reparations? But they're off. They're out. They're they've been dismissed. Whatever that means, whatever mm. that means. Okay. But the lives of those seven people cannot be cannot come back. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Zionist officers who have been sanctioned have been demoted or something like that. But that's it. You know, like Zionists expected it's going to you know stop at that point. You know that there there's no need well, for any prosecution. They don't want to talk about this anymore. They don't want evidence to be presented. <laughs> I want, yeah. I, I mean, I usually don't say this, but I think every government, and United, United States won't do it because I, I, every government, every family of those people needs to, to get us to, to, to not stop now. Hmm. Your, your, your son and daughter, your, your husband and wife, your aunt or uncle, your cousin, your niece, your nephew was murdered by Israel. It's about time somebody makes them pay. Pay for murder. Now, mm -hmm. they murder about things left and right. Nobody ever pays mm -hmm. at all. They never pay. They, they, there's no consequence for murdering a Palestinian. None. Yeah. Yeah. So, I hope that the good families and the governments get together and make Israel pay. Firing yeah. them, firing, firing, or removing them is not enough. Yeah. They were murdered, and we still have it. Somebody needs to release those videos. Yeah, in the Israeli government, in the Israeli military, put them on the internet. Let's because that will help keep the movement alive. To show yeah. the savagery of what occurred. Yeah, that's how I see it right now. Yeah. Because removing them is that's 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 a that's a little it's a, it's a big step, but it had to happen because they were not Arab or black or brown. Yeah. And from, from Arab or black or brown countries. Yeah. That was going, or Asian. They were, that was going to happen. Yeah. You know, that's, that's how that's that's how they roll. We'll throw some out on the bus. Oh, we're sorry. We're taking accountability. Okay. What 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 is accountability? Say so you're mm -hmm. sorry? I don't think so. Yeah. Hey, yeah. You murder somebody. You you openly tracked them down. You shot three. How, how many people know the whole story? Mm. Three cars were bombed. Three cars were, yeah. were shot into by drone by drone operator. Three, not yeah. one. Three. Yeah, three attacks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was three attacks, not just one. Yeah. This was a cold blooded, fact, mm. mm. murder, mm. and they kept killing until they kill everybody. Yeah. So no, the dismissals are not enough. Yeah. I mean, that, that, yeah. I mean, that should have happened the first time when they were oh, like, we got to go do that. Uh, that there need to be trials. All the videos need to be put on, the, uh, made for the world to see. Hmm. You need to be, the, the whole Israeli engagement, the entire Israeli engagement uh, process needs to be uh, shown to the world. I even heard um, that there's a thing called a kill zone. I don't know if you heard this story. Yeah. There's, there's going to be a kill zone now. That anybody in the area will be killed, just mm -hmm. just like in Vietnam, the free fire zone, and mm -hmm. in, in the free fire zone, anything was killed. The house, the the panels were burned in the ground, etc. Yeah. So you know, let's talk about that. Let's you know, if if that doesn't, and I'm saying this, if this is used properly, and I hate to say this, 
But sometimes when they kill white people, things happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just, this is, it's a terrible world we live in. Yeah. You, yeah. you touch white hair. Oh my God. What? Oh no, we have to stop. Wait a minute. It's too much. <laughs> you, you kill, you kill Arabs. You kill, you even kill, I mean, you kill Arabs, you kill Blacks, you kill Africans, you kill Chinese, you kill Indonesians, you kill Samoans, you kill, um, you know, uh, people from the Nets, Lugans, you kill somebody from uh, Bosnia, from Serbia, oh, I don't worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. About yeah. That. You, kill, you kill French, English, oh, no. Oh, <laughs> this is horror. Yeah. And then... You know, the genocide's happening in Sudan and Congo. Oh, well, that doesn't make mainstream oh, news. Oh, well. You know, that's not important oh, enough. That, that's, oh, yeah. oh, well. That's, oh, well. Who, oh, uh, uh, yeah, okay. We, we you know, yeah, I, yeah, anyway, yeah, we need, I hope those families don't settle for this. Yeah. Make them give you some big money. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's all you need. Get yeah. all the documents. Sue them somewhere. Get the yeah. doctors put on the internet because your sons, daughters, husbands, wives were, were murdered by mm -hmm. a government who only reason it did anything because your government said, what the... It, 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 imagine what was going on behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. you, you imagine the phone call they were being made and, and the means they were being held. Mm -hmm. Imagine what was going on. You and I know. There was some, this is serious. Oh, oh no. What? Yeah. And, 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 and if the World Food Program and the World kitchen is was being set up to supplant UNRWA, and that really messed it up, didn't it? But the food, but it stopped. Israel wanted it to stop, didn't it? They mm -hmm. they don't want any food delivered. But now mm -hmm. they have to make some concessions. They, their brazenness and brutality and uh, uh, assaults on humanity have forced mm -hmm. it down back up a little bit. Oh, we'll yeah, 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 yeah. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see, yeah. That's, we'll see. You know, we keep on saying we'll see. But, you uh -huh. know, the United States, you know, they said that they were going to force Israel to open up the uh, crossings to let the aid come in, you know, because right. if they're not allowing the aid to come in, this aid, you know, of the world uh, uh, kitchen, uh, 110 tons, where did it come from? It didn't come from the crossings, not from the trucks. It came from that wharf, you know, that the, that the United States is setting up there. That was U.S. aid that oh, they were feeding in there right there. because there they go. have there to cover go. their asses, you know, because they're being charged with complicity and genocide, you know, by South Africa and the International Court of Justice. But what so you're now, saying, what you're saying is, the people who were murdered, that that aid came directly from the United States. Oh my! Yeah, God. yeah, that was their cover job, you know, and they and their cover job, you know, was messed up, you know. So they they're turning against Israel. They have to. Yeah, they, yeah, they have to. They, 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 have, to. they have to now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even though Israel, you know, has said that they were going to open up the Eretz crossing there. The United States says, oh, they've opened up, you know, there it's crossing, you know, they're all sort of, you know, self-congratulations, you know, for having done something finally. But it turns out, you know, the latest report that I've heard, you know, is this crossing is not open yet. It, it probably is. And there was two trucks that came in to northern Gaza, yeah. just two, with medical supplies, but no food. <laughs> You know, medical supplies for what? For which hospital? All the hospitals, 36 hospitals are are done. You know, they're baked. They're gone. So, you know, like, and, and what about the personnel? You know, like they've been got killed off, you know, in the North especially. So, you know, like, you know, medical supplies, you know, who's going to use them where? You know, like it doesn't make any sense anymore. It's all so uh, surreal. But... The problem is that 68% of the Jewish Israeli public is still in favor of this genocide and increasing the genocide and continuing with this genocide. 68%. I was talking about that earlier today on, on another program I was on, and the host was mentioning the same thing, that Israeli population, the majority are supporting this war. And I said, and it's, it's so the host was saying, we, as I think you have said, there needs to be a way to try to reach the Israeli people and to break them from the solidarity with this war. Hmm. And while I agree on that, at a certain point, well, okay, I do agree with that. How to do that, I don't know. But if they continue to support the war, they will suffer the consequences for that support within the international community and amongst themselves. Hmm. They'll become more racist. They'll become hmm. more violent. They'll, be, hmm. they'll have more stress and more trauma because they decided to go to war on the people who they've oppressed since they first showed up in the area. 
it's very sad. But this, mm -hmm. you, you, like, this is the, this is, I, I guess, it's a very difficult situation to talk about. But the fact that the majority of the people support this violence doesn't doesn't say much for that society right now. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't. Well, it doesn't. I mean, we have this. Sometimes you have to you have to just be frank about situations within societies. Sometimes it looks good, it looks okay, it looks bad. And there's around, it looks bad. Yeah, Not uh, all these people have been raised, you know, to be. In French, it says genocidaire, uh, people who are in favor of genocide, you know, genociders. They have mm -hmm. all been raised, you know, to be like that. And only 68%, you know, are, are following through on the, on the program, on the planned program of the Zionism. So that must mean there is a big opposition beginning to develop as well. Good. Demonstrations certainly are growing. And uh, Chuck Schumer, you know, said that Netanyahu has to go. I mean, you know, what's waiting in the sides, sidelines there, you know, is worse than Netanyahu, but nonetheless, you know, he said Netanyahu has to go, you know, which means that 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 whole governing coalition has to go. And, and if they're subjected to an election, they're not going to make it through in a, another election. You know, their, their support, you know, these uh, fascist groupings, you know, that are, have, have, have stuck together there, they've been losing support. Not that the opposition is that much better. You know, the opposition is not, not, you know, stated that they would be willing to end the war. No. It's, it's you know, it's just too much to take. Well, but I'm going to see what to, what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to go back to the vigil at the Jewish community campus. You know, and I'll see what the Jewish community is reacting, how the Jewish community here in Montreal is reacting to this uh, U.S. Uh, change of heart. Uh, it should bring about a change in the community as well. But it's very difficult, you know, because the Montreal Jewish community is one of the most reactionary conservative communities in, in, in all of North America. But uh, I should certainly give it another try. So, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's, and it's certainly very difficult to do so. I'm still, you know, fasting and uh, right here at the end, you know, of Ramadan, you know, like I'm, it's, in, you know, like it's in the, in the weakest, you know, point uh, of all, you know, it'll be the one last vigil, you know, while fasting. Then after that, uh, I'm going to be off for a couple of weeks, you know, after going in for, uh, no, I'll be there one more time on the vigil. And then I'm going to go into the hospital for my knee replacement because my knees don't work anymore. It's okay. difficult, you know, to be out there for three hours at a time. Well, maybe you should, maybe you should cut, cut it down to one hour. I'm just saying. Once I'm out there, once I'm out there, you know, I don't want to stop. <laughs> you know, I could, oh, saying, because it's so effective, you know, like I, I'm motivated to stay, you know, like in place. So that no, doesn't I'm, matter. You know, like I'll, I'll keep it, you know, going uh, for another two weeks and then I'll, I'll have to um, be in convalescence for, uh, I don't know how long it'll take me to get back out there, you know, but the way things are going, you know, like hopefully this war will have stopped by then. If the United States plays its role as it should, and if well, they don't want to be accused of complicity in genocide and condemned, you know, by the International Court of Justice, which they will be in any case, you know, because they've waited too long, you know, like six months of genocide, you know, is not something that can be overlooked. No way. Well, what I, I want to ask you this, you know, what do you think are the implications for the revolutionary movements around the world in the sense of we have an oppressed peoples, they're being assaulted, they're being gen genocide is being committed against them, and we do see people rising up around the world. Hmm. Well, what are the implications of this this struggle against Israel, against Zionism, for 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 the for the world movements? What do you, what do you think? Oh well, uh, in the Orient, there for sure. You know, like uh, in Egypt, <laughs> Egypt, all Egypt has done is uh, block the uh, Rafa crossing. Uh, and they haven't done anything about, you know, the goods, uh, the transport trucks being blocked from uh, entry into Gaza. I mean, Egypt can, can just, you know, like move in there, you know, and, and get the trucks moving. You know, they can step right into uh, Gaza. You know, Gaza used to be part of Egypt, as a matter of fact. You know, they could shove it right down their throats down past the uh, the uh, Zionist military, which is blocking the aid from coming in. 
but they're not doing it. Okay, they're preparing a a, a big prison there, you know, for the uh, captives that Israel is going to hand over to them. They're collaborating with the Zionist regime. They have to go. You know, the Egyptians know that, but they just have to get themselves organized. There's going to be a revolution in Egypt. You know, that's going to be, you know, blowback from all of this coming okay. down in Egypt. Now. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. It's got to be, you know, like I don't see any sort of, you know, proof to that effect, you know, like I don't hear anything, you know, from Egypt to that effect. And my contact in Egypt, you know, he's in the military now. He can't talk with me. But uh, I'm sure that that's what's, you know, being thought about, you know, in Egypt right now, because this is a military coup regime of Sisi in Egypt, you know, is not uh, is not uh, popular in any way, you know, and he's not doing anything for the Egyptian people uh, with which he can sort of garner any support there either. So that's going to go. And that's going to be a big one. Wow. So you see, so you, so you see some direct impact in in uh, in Egypt. Yeah, Egypt, I think, is the place where it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we, I hope that our listeners will, who if they if they have contacts in Egypt, will, to the extent they can, try to get a feel of what's happening and um, uh, yeah. record, uh, share our videos safely if you can and, and if you cannot safely share the videos try get information and, sh and sh share with us yeah. so you can find out because that whole region i mean egypt uh jordan syria lebanon you know the entire area um yeah yeah, it's yeah. For struggle within the country itself yeah in, in arabic yeah uh, with my little arabic you know i would say you know to the arabic listeners uh, Atora fi uh, Egypt. I forget the name for Egypt. You know, in Arabic, you know, the name for Egypt is not Egypt, of course. But you know, like Arabic comrades, you know, like help the revolution in Egypt. We need you to intervene, and we need Egypt to step up and defend the Palestinians because they're the closest and they're the most strategic, you know, force that can do so. They're needed, and they know that they can achieve you know a great victory for the for the palestinians if they force israel to back down even more so than it is being forced to back down by the u.s and there is some back down by the zionist uh, regime now i mean you know like what did he say he said you know both presidential candidates saying this has got to end you know this war has got to end even trump you know said the other day you know it's got to end i don't know what he means you know by coming to an end you know he may even be, you know, advocating the use of a nuclear bomb on the place, you know, to bring it to an end. But nonetheless, you know, he's saying that it should come to an end, you know, which most people interpret as being uh, a halt of hostilities. So immediately afterwards, all of a sudden, Biden says, yes, it has to come to an end. <laughs> you know, because he was being outmaneuvered, you know, by Trump. <laughs> Trump was taking position to, to, you know, that was more progressive than Biden, you know, on this Gaza war. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it just shows, you know, how out of it, you know, that Zionist Biden, you know, genocide Joe is all about. It's just incredible. It is incredible. It really is incredible what, he, what it's all about. You're exactly right. Yeah. It really is incredible. The maneuvering, the posturing, and yet the arms still get, but even, but Abraham, yeah. even all the statements, the arms and the money keeps going over there. Yeah. Well, the last batch of arms was sent, you know, to Israel by approval from the administration just before Biden changed his position. Okay. What happened? What happened now? So now, you know, like Israel is, is, uh, is, has got the arms, you know, to continue, you know, for another week or two. And then the deciding point of, you know, lack of, you know, ammunition is going to hit them because I don't think the United States is going to be able to to restart, you know, it's 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 uh, ammunition feed, you know, into the war there, you know, because they've said it that they wouldn't do so. So they, you know, you know, they can't go against themselves, you know. So this is a definitive change, you know, policy of the U.S. administration, and it cannot be reversed. So I expect that the war will continue for another week or two, and then it's it's got to stop, you know, because they won't have the means to continue unless they get arms, you know, from. Oh, Germany, yeah, Germany is going to feed them, you know, with uh, ammunition, probably. <laughs> Germany. Uh, uh, I heard a story this morning about Germany. It's not good, man. Uh -huh. I, our movement in Germany is being crushed by yeah. the German government. 
Yeah. Yeah, I've seen world. videos of the police, you know, taking down even Jewish demonstrations against the That's genocide. Yeah. yeah, on the ground that they are anti-Semitic or they're, they're against Israel's policies and practices. Yeah. So yeah. Our, our German our German allies need our eyes on the prize, looking at what's going on and find some way of showing solidarity with them because they're not, they're catching, believe me, their bank accounts are being seized. Hmm. We start mm -hmm. taking their money. We, they, when they start taking your money, they, the, the government means business to shut you down. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they need yeah. I'm, every time, every place I'm talking on the internet, I'm letting people know. Uh, get on the internet, find some shows about what's happening in Germany. Show some support to those comrades and our friends and allies because they need our support. The German yeah. government is, put, is putting it to them. Yeah. In the same way that I mean, yeah. they basically have become the direct conduit of Israeli. Uh, the Israeli government on on the on the anti-war movement in Germany, and, and it's really a shame. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, Germany, you know, like they can't put people in jail, you know, that would be overboard. But you know, they can take away people's means of of living and organizing. Right. They've done that. Okay, I didn't know that, you know, but I did. I I, I just found this morning, and um, I perhaps we can. I'll send you the video that I listened to this morning. It was very graphic. I was I'm very concerned mm. about Germany. I've heard about activists who supported who support the special military operation. The same thing happened to them. They are mm. reporters in, in the Donbass. They're mm. reporters. Their money was seized from their bank accounts. Yes, mm. yes. Wow. So Germany has been. There was a really dirty kind of revolutionary activity to those who show solidarity with the oppressed peoples. And oh. more, focus, more focus need to be put on Germany and what Germany is doing and why. Just before we go, you know, we only have a couple of minutes here. I want to show you, you know, a letter from Einstein, you know, which is right on topic here. Yeah, that's, okay. right. that's right. So, yes. Let me show you that. Uh, I'll have to find it here, you know, because I forgot to set it up. You know, my mind is not working as it should. Well, and okay. uh, it's working fine. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'll look for it, you know, while while you give your concluding remarks. Sure. Well, uh, well first of all, I want to thank everyone for uh, watching this broadcast. Again, like, um, hit, hit the notifications bell and share with your colleagues and friends. We are here to build a real movement for social revolution, to, to overturn the system of imperialism, be it, be it, be it led by the, by the people of Europe, uh, the react some reactionary countries in Asia and um, uh, or, or or United States. Our our movement is internationalist. We support the Palestinian people because they are oppressed peoples whose right to self determination has been taken away by the United States through through the Israeli settler regime. And we appreciate your comments and want you to get involved at the grassroots level to fight imperialism and to bring and, and to bring breakthrough to the oppressed peoples. Yeah. I found it. I found a letter. But uh, my sh my sharing is not working. I don't know why. <laughs> well, Let me yes. try once more here. Okay. There it is. Okay. Let me show you this. Aha. In 1948... In response to the American Friends of the Fighters for the Freedom of Israel, Dear Sir, this is signed by Albert Einstein, when a real and final catastrophe should befall us in Palestine, the first responsible for it would be the British and the second responsible. Um, this is the part where I'm giving, <clears throat> this is the part where I give my final afterthought and then I introduce you to the final presentation. Messiah, or Mashiach, as it is said in Hebrew, uh, means anointed, or, or anointed one. And um, this is one of the things I'm going to have to really get into, is what the Jewish conception of Messiah is. Um, 
Now, both Christians and Muslims have a very disturbing understanding of what Messiah is, although um, I should preface this by saying uh, the Christians have a much far more outlandish understanding of what the Messiah is than what the Muslims think. Muslims see the Messiah as the last Israelite prophet. This is not the case, though. Jesus was not the last Israelite prophet, and that's not what the Messiah is. But, uh, not look, Jesus was not a prophet. He was an excommunicated Pharisee. You notice why he's, why do you think he's always arguing with the other Pharisees? Because that's what Pharisees do. That's what they did. They, they would argue with each other. Um, he was, Jesus was an, uh, was an excommunicated Pharisee with only one sympathizer, that being Nicodemus. Uh, he was not a prophet. And the best thing that ever happened to the Jesus movement was Queen Helena. There is no dispute about this. The best thing that actually, for, from a non-Christian point of view, the best thing to ever happen to the Jesus movement was Queen Helena. Uh, prior to that, the uh, early church was a bunch of bickering, uh, squabbling, argumentative, contradictory doctrine people. You know, ask yourself this question, why does the New Testament have so many what would seem to be uh, unresolvable contradictions? And that's because <clears throat> in the unification of all the Christians, they took... Uh, different scriptures that conflicted with each other, and they basically synthesized it through a doctrine. Uh, this doctrine is understood through the Nicene Creed, otherwise known as the Creed of the Apostles. Um, you know, the, the people don't know that prior to um, Queen Helena, there were uh, Christians that wanted to throw away their Old Testament because they thought any Jewish influence was evil. So, you can the thing about christianity is that it's, it's exclusively legend pretty much everything they believe is exclusively legend not a lie just legend <clears throat> um <clears throat> king uh Kypris of persia is called mashiach in the jewish bible there's different ways mashiach is brought about um, and when Jewish people talk about Mashiach, we typically are referring to the Judite king that is expected to come. Uh, but there's not just, but, but the Messiah is, but, but the human Messiah factor goes into the, goes into, um, someone from the line of Judah, someone from the line of Levi, and someone from the line of Joseph. And if we were to take that very seriously, that means that the, that the Josephite Messiah would be a Samaritan. Um, there's so much I need to explain about this, because people get a lot of these things wrong, but I, 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 I'm working on that. I'm in that process. But um, I would like to, again, reinforce this notion. It is the rabbinite who determines Jewish, who's Jewish, particularly an Orthodox rabbinite. Um, <clears throat> they define who's Jewish. What the Bund does have a right to do, and it falls to us to do this because the proper Rabbinites don't get into this, what the Bund is, should do, and I'm, I'm pushing that it does this more, is identify who has Jewishness. Not who's Jewish, who has Jewishness. Because the simple truth is having Jewishness doesn't make you Jewish, but having Jewishness is enough to be part of the Bund. Um, several Christians and Muslims have Jewishness. Um, uh, however, uh, the Christians that have Jewishness are usually mitigated. To, you know, it's usually this usually applies to the Christians of the Orient. Um, no one is Jewish and Muslim. No one is Jewish and Christian. There are Muslims with Jewishness, and there are Christians with Jewishness. There are some Baha'i faith people with Jewishness, such as the next, such as the person who's uh, uh, going to be featured next. Um, there are Hindus with Jewishness. There are Buddhists with Jewishness. But what binds the Jewish people together is the fact that it's a to it's the Torah culture. When you leave that, you do you do leave the nation. Now, does that mean you're no longer related? Well, that would depend if you still have Jewishness. A, a lot of 
people, you know, need to um, get hip to what's going on here. The old Boond was was not concerned with being pro-religion. The new Boond is. Now, just like before, just like the old Boond, Boond the new Boond is not uh, a religious institution. If you are found with Jewishness, but you've converted to a different religion, or if you um, are of a different religion and you've acquired Jewishness somehow, that is enough to be in the boon. Now, one thing I need to make clear here is Zionism contradicts Jewishness. It does not only contradicts... Zionism not only contradicts Judaism, Zionism contradicts Jewishness. And, you know... Um, We have to, we have to start taking um, this more seriously. Um, there has to be like levers and measures of you know re re reciprocity. So if you're, if you consider yourself Jewish, but you're not actually Jewish, fine. So long as you have Jewishness, and you can't force Jewish people to acknowledge non-Jewish people as Jewish. Um, Another thing to remember is being Jewish has nothing to do with DNA sequences. It has nothing to do with race or, 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 and or ethnicity. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with a cultural religious practice. Uh, you know, it's a, it, you know, the, the Jewish nation is a, is a fraternal diaspora nation. Um, it is a people nation, not a nation state. Ham, Hamadinat Velo Yisrael. There is Hamadinat Velo Yisrael. The state is not Israel. Um, and so just for those that see this, just remember that what gives you qualification for Bundism is not being Jewish, but whether, but if you have Jewishness and this is something the Bund must, you know, consider itself with because the authentic Rabbinites don't really understand what Jewishness is. And it's not that they wouldn't, it's that all this pressure of trying to conform within the world of the Gentiles, has forced rabbis to basically keep Jewishness in the closet. Jewishness and Judaism are both features of the Jewish nation, but um, Jewishness goes beyond just Jewish people. Those who are related to the Jewish people have Jewishness. And, you know, you could be not born of Jewish parents, but spend enough time around Jewish people and, and then end up with Jewishness. And if that is the case, you probably should be in the Bund as well, um, because these things do happen. So I'm going to uh, finish this up by presenting you with Mark Foster. I have a lot more videos which I'm going to be putting out, but um, I think that a video focusing on the fact that there is a genocide going in Gaza, there's a genocide going on in Palestine. The Palestinians are an indigenous group which must exist. Palestine is the land of Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. It is the pan-Abrahamic holy land. And the Bund is for decolonization all the way. Hi folks, this is Mark by Mark A. Foster, PhD, for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Today, I will be talking about three subjects which I will relate to each other throughout this podcast. First, Indigism. Second, Bundism. And third, Gaza and the Palestinians in general. Let me begin with some basic definitions of those terms. What is indigism? Indigism is a respect for indigenous people around the world, a respect for their rights. As I have mentioned before, one of the major characteristics that is shared by many, but not necessarily all, indigenous people is a love of the land, a loyalty to, to the land, the land often viewed as the mother. They are the children of the land. The land is regarded many times as sacred 
it is not a concept, sadly, I would say, that I can personally relate to, which means that I am not an indigenous person. Now, if you want to use the term indigenous in a very broad sense, we are all indigenous, meaning we all originate from somewhere, and I am no exception. But that doesn't mean that I am indigenous in the modern use of the term, because I have no special affinity for any particular part of the world. I have lived in numerous parts of the United States, born and raised in New York City, then lived in the South, the Midwest, and now in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Do I feel any special connection with any of those places? The answer to that question is no, I don't. When I left a place and moved to a new place, I very rarely even missed it. The one exception, I suppose, was when I left New York City. But in that case, I did not miss the land. What I missed were the bookstores, literally, because I would love going into Manhattan and trouncing around from one bookstore to another back in the days before books were available on digital platforms, like on Google or Kindle or whatever. So that's what I missed. It was not the land. It was not the, the, the space that was occupied by New York City, but it was bookstores. And I would look forward to my regular trips back to New York to go back to those bookstores. But I am not indigenous. In fact, I know very few people and have known throughout my life very few people who were indigenous. So indigenous people in my life have been rare. And I regret that. I really do. I wish that I would have known more indigenous people, but as a college professor, with what I did living in university and college areas, you are not likely to meet that many indigenous people. Now, I have met some. I have been on some tribal reservations in various parts of the U.S., so I have interacted with some people who are indigenous, but not that many. And some of my experiences on those reservations were rather sad because I saw the horrendous poverty which existed, not, not on all, but on many of those reservations. And that's a memory that will stay with me for the rest of my life. I sometimes think of it literally as I am going to sleep. I recall this one place I went to where people were so poor, they literally had no food to eat in their home at the time when I was visiting it. That's how poor they were. So there are people like that. Sadly, and many of them are indigenous who live under those circumstances. So I love indigenous people, but I'm not an indigenous person because, again, my ties to the land are basically non existent. I could really care less where I live. The only reason I moved here to the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, is for its climate. That's it. Apart from that, I could care less. I feel literally no attachment to this place. And I feel no attachment to any place, to be honest. I wish I did.
I wish I did, but I'm being honest. I don't feel any attachment to, to the land. I do not see the land as my mother, and I do not regard myself as a child of the land, which is, in my view, very sad, because I think I'm missing out on something which is very important. Okay. So, basically, what indigenism is, it is the respect which is shown to indigenous peoples. Doesn't matter where they are, whether you're talking about American Indians or Inuit people or Native Hawaiians uh, or um, the, the Aboriginal people of Australia or the Maori people uh, of New Zealand, people like that, in my view, occupy a special place in the world and they should be treasured literally treasured and protected sadly in many parts of the world that protection is not taking place an example along the amazon river there are many native peoples Back in the 1970s, there was a movie made about these peoples. The movie was made in a very careful way so as not to disrupt the lives of the people living in those communities. They were fascinating. Some of them spoke with cliques. Many of them wore no clothing. Um, it was like entering into different worlds. They had no televisions, no radios, nothing. Nothing that could be considered as being a part of modernity. They were entirely cut off from the modern world. And yet they seemed to be very, very happy. Now, if you go there, it is not like that at all anymore. Are those tribes still there? Yes. Although many of them have left and gone to the big cities, but the tribes are still there. But now they are all fully dressed. They have computers and TV sets and all the things that you might associate with being a modern person. Now, whether they like it or not, I have no idea. But to me, it is a loss. Why did that happen to those people? Pure capitalist greed. Logging. There was a desire for the wood in the jungles where those Amazonian people lived. And so rather than care for the Amazonian people, they simply went in, tore down much of the jungles and exposed the people living there to the modern world. And so that was really the end not only of one culture, but of many cultures that ended based upon capitalism, the desire for money placed ahead of people. So a person who advocates for indigenism, including myself, would oppose that kind of thing and would support the rights of indigenous people throughout the world. Now, let's get into a specific category of indigenism. And that is um, the notion of the of the boond. That is that is who the boond who the boond are. And I have taken some notes 
And so I will be periodically reading from, or at least looking at those notes, which again is why I have my glasses on. Um, in terms of Gaza, in terms of Gaza, and Gaza has been a major focus these days for the Boone's movement, which I am a part of. I am a part of the Boond, very much a part of it. I won't get into the specifics. I will just say that I am a part of the Boond, meaning an anti-Zionist movement which respects the rights of Palestinians, which supports the rights of Palestinians. Now, the Boond existed once before and disappeared. So now this new Boond was started primarily by Abraham Weisfeld and a few others. Uh, it has some similarities with the old Boond, but not entirely. For example, the old Boond was entirely secular. The new Boond is a mixture of secular and religious people. Now, when I say I am a part of the Boond, I am making a somewhat controversial statement. Here's why. Although I am from an Ashkenazi Jewish family, and if somebody called me an Ashkenazi Jew, I would not object. Although I would clarify it to say, yes, I am an Ashkenazi Jew, but when I was 14, I converted to another religion, which is true. I think that would be accurate and honest. Um, so because I converted to another religion, some people may have problems with my calling myself a part of the Boond. Not me, I don't, but I can understand why, why some people would. The leadership of the Boond does not have a, a problem with it. So I'm so I am accepted as being a part of the Boond. And I love the Boond. I despise Zionism. And I love working with other people of Jewish ancestry who, like me, are anti-Zionists and, like me, are pro-Palestinian. The Palestinians are the indigenous people of that area. The Israelis are not. But we'll get into that in just a bit. The Israelis can only claim, I wrote, to have an indigenous ancestry in the distant past based on sacred history. As any historian knows, sacred history is legend, not history. So, for example, the Tanakh, or Old Testament, and the New Testament are both legendary. Why? Because there is no real historical evidence to support most of its content. Uh, like there's no historical evidence that most or any of the individuals mentioned in the Tanakh, like Moses, for example, ever existed. I once had a, uh, what I think of as a rather odd conversation with a Christian, I guess, fundamentalist or evangelical, whatever. And he said to me that there is more evidence for the resurrection of Christ than there is for the existence of Napoleon. And I turned to him and I said, You've got to be joking. Said, no, there is. And I said, by evidence, 
what do you mean? Well, it's discussed in the Bible. And I said, well, problem. The Bible is not history, meaning it is not based on primary historical sources, eyewitness accounts. It's not. And so because none of either the Tanakh or the New Testament is based on primary historical data to claim that either of those parts of the Bible uh, are history would be a lie. Obviously, he didn't agree with me, but the conversation basically ended at that point because he realized, I guess, that he was not going to win me over uh, to his side of the argument. And of course, there was no way that he could do that. I mean, I know what history is. I've studied history. My PhD minor was in history. So I, I know how to define it. And I know what is history and what is sacred history. And the Bible is a collection of texts which can be called sacred history, meaning they're historical documents which are used to support the belief systems of particular religious organizations. That's it. That's what sacred history is. It's nothing more than that. Um, and so, no, the Bible does not contain history. Now, there is one slight exception to what I just said, but it's not really much of an exception. And that is the existence of Jesus. Although it is still reasonable to debate the idea of whether Jesus actually existed, and people on both sides, and I'm talking about academics, not believers, can say, yes, he existed, or no, he did not exist, and both could produce evidence to support their statements. The only evidence, if you want to call it that, is in the writings of Josephus, because Josephus actually wrote about Jesus. But again, it was not an eyewitness account. Josephus, in other words, was not using primary historical sources. Instead, he was using secondary historical sources, meaning information that was told by one person to another person, which I guess you could call hearsay. That's basically what secondary historical data is. It is hearsay. So, um, no, the Bible is not a historical document. And even if you look at individual books, um, individual books, it would appear in many cases, were written by different people, meaning the same book has content from different individuals. People who claim that the five books of Moses or the Pentateuch or the Torah, same thing, uh, were actually written by Moses, have a really tough burden. Why? Well, a number of reasons. But the main one is that at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of the Torah, there is a long description of the death of Moses. Now, you can say, which some people actually have, well, Moses was a prophet, so he was predicting his own death. But if you read the account, it does not read like a prophecy. It reads like a story about something that happened. It's not a prophecy. It's a story. It's an account of what happened when this guy who may or may not have even existed when he died. That's what the story is about. It's nothing more than that. So, if we cannot take, especially the Tanakh, as a 
primary historical source, which we can't because it is not one, then the idea of the existence of an ancient Israel, or in Hebrew, Yisrael, is questionable. Was there ever an ancient Israel? Maybe, maybe not. Now, there is evidence that the land that was occupied by Israel, the larger piece of land called Canaan, there is archaeological evidence that Canaan did, in fact, exist. But as to the specifics of the existence of Israel, no. And the accounts in the Tanakh uh, about Israel are not supported by history either. There is no history. In fact, you can say for all intents, intents and purposes, history did not exist until about 500 years ago. There really was no history until relatively recent in the past. So the idea that the Jews lived in Israel, you can say it, you can believe it, but there is no real historical evidence to support it. What's more, the idea that the Jews are the chosen people. Okay, let's set aside the issue of the, the reliability and validity of the Tanakh. The term chosen people is not once, not once used in the Tanakh. It may be used in some other Jewish literature. I don't know. Uh, possibly in parts of the Talmud, maybe, but I've asked people and they couldn't point me to any place. Um, so I, again, I, I, maybe they just didn't know themselves, but the people I asked were Jewish scholars and they couldn't point me to places either. So the concept of the chosen people is literally not biblical. A term that is close to that is used in the Tanakh. And that is God's treasured people. But that's not the same as chosen people. Chosen would apply a kind of privilege, a destiny, like you are destined to live in a certain land in the future. Treasured just implies basically that God loves you. Well, presumably, God loves everyone. So I'm not sure how that establishes Jews as especially unique, although I could be wrong. But again, this notion of chosenness, which, by the way, is not accepted by most Jews in the Western world, it is Orthodox Jews, traditional Jews, and conservative Jews, or at least some conservative Jews, who accept it. The majority of American Jews are Reformed Jews. And there is also a denomination or movement called Reconstructionism or Reconstructing Judaism they are a much smaller liberal Jewish movement. They argue, no, Jews are not the chosen people. So they, they've entirely rejected that idea. So in other words, most American Jews, if they are aware of what their movement teaches, assuming they even belong to one, reject the idea of the Jews as chosen people. I know my parents found that idea to be laughable. They didn't accept it. I found it to be disgusting myself. My sister also finds it to be disgusting. Most Jews I know don't accept it. I mean, it's not a popular idea uh, because it's elitist. 
It establishes Jews as somehow existing on some exalted level above other people. That's not a very nice thing to say. That's not a good way to look at your fellow human beings, to see yourself as superior to them. In academia, the term we use for that is triumphalism, meaning that, that your own people have triumphed over everyone else. That's not a good way to look at other people. Really, it's not a good way. And I hope if you feel that way, that you will give it a second thought and give it up and begin looking at everyone else as your peers and not as members of your own particular religion as being the superiors of everyone else. Because you're not. You can take my word for it. You're not. I'm not. And I'm one of you. And I am not superior to anybody. If anything, I see myself as an inferior ant, literally. I do not regard myself as being elevated at all. Um, I might as well be a cockroach or some other kind of insect. That's how I see myself. And I'm not lying. I literally see myself in that kind of lowly way. So, point is, Canaan was home to many Semitic peoples. Maybe, maybe, the Hebrews or Israelites were among them, but also maybe not. But taking a statement like that and using it to establish the chosenness of the Jewish people to live in the Holy Land and to do what is happening right now with the Israeli Defense Forces basically attempting to kick the Gazans out of Gaza and into Egypt. And the Gazans, they are the indigenous people of that land. As I am not indigenous to anywhere because I have no connection to any land. The Israelis who live in Israel, they are not indigenous to Israel. They come from Europe, from North America, from Australia, New Zealand, whatever. They are not indigenous to Israel. The Palestinians are the ones who are indigenous to that area, which is why I say Palestine from the river to the sea. And so as someone connected with Bund, I support the right of Palestinians. And I challenge the right or the rights of Israelis to dominate that area. Does that mean I think that they should be kicked out? Well, my own personal view is that people should be allowed to live wherever they want. I don't think that is necessarily a universal idea, however. For example, if you are talking about a tribal area, should I be allowed to live in their, tri in their tribal area and to disrupt their activities? I would say no. So I think there are exceptions to that. But generally speaking, I would say that it is a good thing that anybody should be able to live anywhere they want. I know here in the U.S., there is all this, for lack of a better term, paranoia about Mexico and about Mexicans crossing over the border. Some of that is legitimate, but most of it is not. The part that is legitimate is the drug trade by the cartels. That is not a good thing because a large portion of drugs that we get here in the U.S. come directly from Mexico, two miles from my south. And I don't want to see that continue. But why is that happening? It's happening 
because the Mexicans, many of whom regard themselves as indigenous people, are so poor that they literally have had no alternative but to turn to the drug trade as a simple means of survival. Do I, do I approve of that? No. Do I understand it? Of course I understand it. But it also means that although I would like to travel throughout Mexico, just cross over the border, say, to Reynosa, which is the closest Mexican city to me, I realize that if I went there, I might have my head chopped off, which is not a very pleasurable thought. So I may go there eventually, but so far I have not. There are parts of Mexico, primarily Nuevo Progreso, which are relatively safe, and that is where I go for now. But it's a tourist town, so it's not a real place where Mexicans live. Uh, I want to go to a real place where Mexicans live. That's what I want to see. But sadly, because of the tremendous poverty that exists in that country, what am I going to do? I mean, I can take a bus or take a cab across, to, across the Rio Grande River to Reynosa and sit on a bench. There are benches, apparently, right after you cross over. But what am I going to do? I don't speak Spanish. If I started walking around, I would become noticeable. And there is a reasonable chance I might be caught and killed. Um, I don't mind being killed, but being tortured is something else. I, I, I don't really want to be uh, tortured as I think most people, I don't think most people would like to be tortured. Now, to conclude this podcast, which I think is a very convincing way of concluding this podcast, at least I hope it is, I assume that most of you know that maternally, all of us have a female ancestor who has been nicknamed Eve for logical reasons from Africa. What that means is that maternally, we can all trace our ancestry back to Africa. Yeah. Does that make me an indigenous African? I mean, that's kind of a stupid question. Obviously, I am not an indigenous African. The fact that my ancestry is in Africa, so what? It does not make me an indigenous African. Similarly, even if, and we can only say if, we accept the tentative proposition that Jews or Hebrews lived in ancient Israel, um, does that mean that the Jews now who are living in modern Israel have an indigenous right to be there? No. The same thing as me saying, because my ancestry is African, does not mean I have a right to move to anywhere in Africa I want. I mean, if I wanted to go there, I suppose I could. I visited the place, Congo, but I don't have a right to go there, nor do I really have any desire to go there. I have nothing against Africa. It's a beautiful place, but I have no attachment to it. But then again, I have no attachment to any place which is why I am not indigenous. But for those people who genuinely are indigenous people, they should, in my view, be treated with the greatest amount of love and compassion that is possible. But sadly, throughout the world, 
We are not doing that at all. And that is a real disaster. It is, it is, I would even even say as a religious person, sinful. It is sinful the way that we are treating the the Gazans in Africa. And when I say we, I'm including myself because I am an American. And the war by Israel against Gaza could not be taking place if if it were not for um well if it were not for the united states the united states is providing all the money all the arms to israel they are allowing israel to do this so i think we are as sinful again using that religious term as the israelis and I think that we deserve to suffer. I really do. I'm sorry for getting religious on you. And I, I don't like doing that generally. But I really think that we deserve to suffer. I think Israelis should suffer. I think that Americans should suffer. I do believe in collective punishment. Even though I am not a part of what is happening in Washington or what is happening in Jerusalem, I am still an American. And as an American, I feel as though I deserve a, por a portion of the blame. And I, should, I have no right, in my opinion, literally, no right to continue living. Does that mean I'm going to commit, commit suicide? No, I'm, I'm not suicidal. I'm not going to take my life. That's not the way I am. But do I think I have a right to live? No. No, I don't think I have a right to live. Whether I live is not my choice. But, but I feel that any American, any Israeli who is alive should be living on borrowed time. And that is literally how I see the Bund. As a part of indigism. Respect for the indigenous people of Palestine. And not for the thieves, the robbers that entered into Palestine and stole the land and are now trying to steal even more land than before. For the time being, this has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, PhD, for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Have a pleasant day and a better day tomorrow.